Right, we'll make a start. Good morning, everyone. Um, thank you for coming along today. I was asked if I'd do a quick introduction. So uh, my name is Andrew Besford. Uh, I've been involved with Dynamo Northeast for the last couple of years now, and uh, I'm a non-exec director of Northumbria Healthcare NHS Foundation Trust. Um, so if you're joining us from outside the region, um, Dynamo is a not-for-profit uh, with the mission to grow the tech economy in the northeast of England. And um, Dynamo's had some great successes in areas like digital construction. And we're now setting up something similar in the broad sort of area of health tech. Um, so today is the first event of that new bit of cluster work that we're doing. And uh, we're delighted that CGI have been able to help us bring this together. So uh, they've helped bring together a really great lineup of speakers today. So we've got um, CGI are going to open things, then we've got um, Blue Prism are going to uh, talk to us with Connect Health. Uh, we've got UiPath who are going to talk with NHS England and NHS Improvement. And we've got Automation Anywhere going to talk with Newcastle Hospitals and we've got Cloud Trade coming up after that. So we've got a really broad range of views from the health system and from technology companies and we've got some real examples uh, so we're grateful to all the speakers this morning and uh, to the CGI team for all the work they've done to bring that together. Um, Claire could you pop up the first slide please because I just wanted to quickly mention by way of introduction that um, there's been a group behind the scenes that's been coming together with the local enterprise partnership and others to um, bring together what this can look like in the northeast and um, Part of the start of this has been understanding the landscape and uh, I'm not going to talk through all of this but just wanted you to be aware that it's going on because some of you will be very familiar with this or parts of this. Um, so these are the organisations that have been becoming involved so far and um, Claire if you could move on um, I just wanted to share a little bit about the work that that group's come up with to identify the themes that they want to be focusing on. So um, this is still in its early days. So I think the key message around this is really that um, the group would like health providers, businesses uh, who are part of this to help shape it. So it's really useful to them. But I guess um, if these are the, the sort of um, the focus themes that are, that are emerging so far, I guess all of this is based on, we've already got a great reputation in the region for the health system in general. And this is sort of working towards saying, well, how can we model what a a digital health system can look like that's recognised nationally and beyond and how can that help us really work on improving outcomes for patients in the region and at the same time creating more and better jobs in the tech sector which is really the, the sort of motivation for this sort of health tech cluster slant on it as well. And um, so Dynamo's got a partnership growing with CGI that I think can really bring a lot to this so there's already some successes with um, partnering with local small businesses to bring their innovations uh, to the market, to health providers in a way that small businesses generally find very difficult, if possible at all. Um, and I think um, those of us on the buying side of this are really very aware of the social value that we can create by working locally and whether that's in the way we build our buildings or the way we uh, invest in technology. And um, we want to do that wherever we can. So uh, this is something that we hope will um, enable some connections to be made that help us work towards that. And so one of the early themes that had a lot of interest was around process automation, and that's what's led to today's event. So and I guess we're all uh, very well aware that the, the system's gearing up again for um, what comes next with COVID. And um, automation is something that's very much front of mind. So um, it's one of those things that we were thinking about anyway, but it's been accelerated as part of the COVID response. And there's um, lots of different angles on this, whether it's in a clinical context or the back office. So I'm going to hear a range of different perspectives on that now. And um, so a, a big aim for this session is that we can start to get to know each other and start to be able to collaborate. So um, please ask questions, please do um, comment in uh, Zoom. And um, so I, I hope everyone takes away some useful material and makes some new connections out of this. And um, what's next is really um, up to you. So um, Emma Wissenstor is going to come on now to introduce our speakers. And Emma is bringing all of this together from Dynamo. And uh, so Emma is the person to talk with about uh, who, can, uh, who can best sort of shape this agenda to help it really work for you. So uh, I see Emma's now appeared. So good morning, Emma. Uh, so I'm going to hand over very briefly to Emma to introduce the speakers and then Emma's going to take us through the morning and then host some Q&A at the end. 
Thank you, Andrew. What a lovely introduction. Um, yes, so it's my pleasure to introduce all of our wonderful speakers today. Um, and as you all have seen, we've got a jam-packed agenda, so I'm going to dive straight in. Um, the first section that we have up is uh, our lovely partners for the Health Tech Cluster CGI. Uh, we've got Justine Ewing, the Vice President for Scotland, and Narlin Manotra, the Director of Digital Transformation for CGI, and they're going to talk us through Automa automation in healthcare, um, the business case. So I'll hand straight over to Justine now. Hi, can you hear me okay? Yes. Yes, we can hear you. Oh, good, thank you. So good morning, everyone. It's um, really a delight uh, to be invited here today. Thank you very much uh, for inviting me along uh, to present to you. CGI are really proud to be partners uh, in this initiative and um, are really keen to see how we, we can support the region and uh, the work that we're trying to do here. So um, hopefully you can see my screen OK. What I'm going to do is just Nalan's uh, going to join me towards the end of this presentation, but I'm just going to talk uh, more generally. Um, I mean, I don't know, um, from an automation perspective, it's clearly quite new within health and care in some areas, and there are some places where uh, automation isn't necessarily felt that it would drive that much value, but I think that's to do with understanding the opportunity that presents itself. And I know you're going to hear from Isabel Stewart in a little while, um, who I've been working with in relation to some work that we're doing up here in Scotland. So it's been um, a really interesting journey for us, particularly with RPA over the last year. So we'll be quite happy to take you through that. But just a little bit about um, us. So, um, Nalan, I don't really want to speak for you. Do you want to just give yourself a little bit of an introduction about your background? Hi, everyone. Yeah, thanks, Justine. I'm Nalan Merotra. I um, look after our digital advisory capability, if you like, in the UK. Um, so we, we work with clients across um, a range of uh, sectors, actually, um, to develop and implement their digital strategies broadly. Um, including automation, of course. Um, and on the automation topic, I think you know, one of the key things we <clears throat> work with our clients on is uh, in selecting the right uh, processes for automation and ensuring that um, you know, their investments deliver the required returns on investment. Um, so that's a bit about what I'll touch on a bit later um, in today's session. Thanks, Nalan. Um, and as for me, I mean, I actually spent two years uh, living in um, Chesterley Street and working in Newcastle, so not um, being a resident of the, of the area. And I um, do have quite a, a fond affiliation and some great experiences, actually, for the, the time that I did work there a few years back. Um, but currently now living in Scotland, um, I do look after a range of business in Scotland, but I'm also um, supporting the health and care practice across the UK, um, which is really exciting. Um, my background before I joined CGI three years ago, um, I used to be the Scottish Government's um, Digital and Health and Care um, Institute Chief Executive, so it's more commonly referred to as DHI. Um, and the Digital Health Institute is basically the front door for innovation into the NHS in Scotland. Um, I worked there for four years and then before that worked for NHS 24. So for those that are not that familiar with that, that's the equivalent of the 111 service. And prior to that, I, I was uh, back in the dark side of um, commercial world. So do miss public sector, but I think that balance of having six years in uh, the health uh, sector really helps with the work that we're trying to do um, now. So moving on, um, I'm not really going to spend very much time on this slide, but just to give you a little bit of perspective um, in terms of CGI. CGI in the UK isn't it's not the first name that you think of when you think about um, digital health or care or to health tech. Um, there are other of our competitors that maybe come to mind before we do. But our pedigree is particularly strong globally. And here in the UK, um, in 
specifically, uh, we do look after uh, the MOD's uh, health and care system and the integrated records um, supporting military uh, families, um, both in the UK and when they are on deployment, uh, to make sure that the, the data is, is at the hands of any uh, clinical requirement. Uh, well, hopefully it's never needed, um, but it is there and that's something that we do and, and we've been doing for quite a long while. Um, we also support just about 45,000 um, uh, health and care professionals across the UK and that ranges from our ability to uh, enable social workers to do uh, their role in terms of supporting elderly, vulnerable uh, and uh, children, um, as well as the work that we're doing uh, more uh, south of England actually in terms of um, healthcare systems and supporting IT network. So we're very familiar um, with uh, the health and care sector in CGI. We do uh, and absolutely focus on the IHI Triple AIM initiative, which is up in the top corner there. Um, so we're very focused on making sure that there is benefit to anything that we are doing, that we are aiming to drive those three benefits out of the work uh, that we do. So I'll not dwell on that uh, too much more. And if anyone's got any questions, I'm happy to take them. Uh, offline um, or through this session. This is um, my view of, um, and literally is my view, of, I've got a picture, which um, you probably, I don't know if you can see the video that I drew a, a few Sundays ago, which we've now made a little bit more professional than my cartoon drawing about what I think the health and care system in the UK is starting to do, because it's vastly changing. Um, it, it was changing already before um, this pandemic occurred uh, and the pandemic has helped accelerate um, the, the change in relation to the adoption of digital technologies and uh, the, the opportunity that will exist specifically in areas of automation to free up um, clinical workers, uh, clinical and health professionals to be able to do much more valuable tasks. But the reality is that the whole ecosystem is changing quite uh, dramatically. It's changing because of the demographics, which I'm sure all of the people on, that are on this call will be aware of. It's also changing very much the way that health and social care is delivered. And it is um, a clear fact that people do do better when they are in their own homes rather than when they're in facilities away from family, friends and things that are all natural and comforting to them. So the, the how we start to think and evolve is going to be really interesting, particularly in the next 12 to 18 months, because there's a very unique opportunity that the pandemic will drive to help some of the change that a lot of us have been advocating for quite a long time. And part of the reason that I left public sector and I genuinely loved the job that I did. We were doing so, so many amazing good things. And, and that organisation that I used to lead is still doing amazing and great things. But the pace of change when I left three years ago was still not fast enough for me. Um, and there's a an element of I would have done anything to have this situation three years ago because we would have made some great strides when I was there. But the fact that it is here now means that there is an opportunity and, and we should just not forget that. And what this picture is really saying is that the formal care settings um, have a place, absolutely, but that should be much more in the, the more acute end of things. The home and the, the supported living uh, piece for, for those that have got an interest in that will start to really come to the fore, particularly with the development of IoT and smart housing. But then how do you play in uh, automation and robotics to that? Because that whole ability to create more capacity in the care workforce becomes the reality when you start to think about the data that already exists today that's not being used to be able to support that. And then you've got to look at what's going on in terms of research, the universities, academia, the pharma companies, what role do they play? And very clearly, I, well, it's not very clearly to you, but I'm about to tell you, I think that they have a massive role to play, but bringing them into that ecosystem and engaging them at the right time is absolutely key. So I just thought I'd share that um, little picture with you because I think that there is a very definite shift occurring. And I think now is the time for us to try and make the most of that.
But moving more in specifically to talk about automation, I mean, we um, are actively um, automating already in financial services, central government, utilities uh, across the world. We've got various um, really good use cases of what we're doing in health, and we're really keen to see how we can support that um, here in the UK. And you can see that we're already partnering with some really uh, amazing organisations, some of whom you're going to hear from today. But one of the things that I did want to draw out was that one of the things that CGI prides itself on is the ability to bring small and medium enterprises into our supply chain. We make use of that um, that opportunity to support our agility and our dynamism. You know, we are a, a corporate organisation. We're quite a large corporate, global corporate organisation, which does mean at times that we can't necessarily be as fleet of foot as we would like to be. But working with partners, particularly SMEs, that gives us that fleet of foot. But the key thing about that as well is it then supports the circular economy, the job creation and the opportunity to support small companies to grow. And we've got several you know, amazing examples of where we've supported small companies to become medium ones. Um, and actually some of those are actually on the tipping point of being able to come up, become large organisations. But for us, the whole play in automation is absolutely about focusing on creating that capacity and supporting um, our very valuable health and care resources to be doing things that are clearly of more value to the patients and the service users of the systems um, that they are um, engaged with. And really, I suppose what I'm saying um, in this, and I'd really like um, the the, the, all of you to really think about this today is that we are at this real pivotal moment um, that the pandemic is forcing change and is forcing us to think differently and is applying pressure to a system that was already experiencing some challenges both financially and from a human resource perspective and um, keeping people um, in the roles and stopping them from uh, going too early, but also creating that attractiveness for uh, young people to want to come in and choose a career in this sector. Um, and all of that put together gives us a bit of a crisis, but crisis, with crisis and challenge also comes opportunity. So, you know, as you hear the speakers talking to you today, have a think about the things that you're doing, doing on a day-to-day -day basis. You know, are those things that you're doing that are very, uh, process oriented um, transactional are those things that automation could support to allow you to go and do something or your um, colleagues or your clients to go and do something that's uh, much more valuable to the people hands on. So have a think about that because I think it's really key. A um, couple of case studies here. I'm, I'm sure we're probably going to share the slides afterwards. So I'm not going to go through this in a, a huge amount of um, detail. But you can see here that uh, with one of our clients that we're working with, we have actually um, developed a, a, a RPA solution that we're working with, particularly in relation to the pandemic, to support um, faster uh, faster test results and um, better appointment setting and trying to remove a lot of the um, administrative burden that this uh, situation has brought to us as well and you can see and Nalan will talk to you a bit about this as well you know the process of being able to identify suitable um, tasks and processes for RPA is really key and you have to be able to be very clear that what you are going to attempt to do with RPA will drive the type of results that you want. And uh, that's a key part of the process of being able to do that. The things that we've identified uh, with the Swedish hospital was very particular in relation to trying to free up uh, staff to be able to support the contact tracing element of uh, their response um, nationally. So a really good uh, use and example of how uh, RPA can really come in and make a bit of a difference. The other one um, is biotech organisation, uh, which is a, a USA client, actually, United States client. Um, but what this really shows you is that what we were trying to do was look at how we could use RPA to support um, plasma therapy in release. So a very clinical example. So I've deliberately chosen um, two 
different types of examples to kind of share with you today. And the key thing, and again, just really thinking about this, that it's a, a transactional process that someone just repeatedly does that's been able to be uh, taken over by a, a bot to be able to enable folks to go and do something a little bit different. Um, and I'm sure we all love our Excel spreadsheets, um, but there's absolutely a, a more efficient and cost effective way to do this and those types of things. But as I say, we will share uh, these slides and you can have a look at these and there's more information about them as well on our website. The key thing really, uh, before I, I hand over uh, to, to Nalan, is that there are lots of things, if you think about a whole organisation and what's in it, you know, and particularly in relation to health and care, all of these boxes on here try and bring out um, process areas of, of transaction that we think is worth having a look at in terms of where uh, RPA might be able to play a role. You know, and you could pick any one of these. Um, I know, um, I think Isabel's going to talk a little bit about um, GP referrals later. You know, and that is quite a, a manual process um, here in Scotland. And I know it's um, pretty much the same in England and in um, other parts of the UK. But that GP making a referral to a clinician, you know, the process of making sure that that person's the right person, that they're going to see uh, the right clinician, getting an appointment, writing back to the patient to let them know that they've got an appointment, all done in written form rather than text or anything else, um, you know, is a phenomenal use of, you know, a quite a high number of FTE within a, a health board, as we call them in Scotland, or trusts in England. Um, you know, and the ability to be able to take those staff and do something else with them is really key. One of the things that I hear quite a lot from um, chief executives here in Scotland and the health boards is that they can, they, they're not struggling uh, to, you know, try and make redundancies or cost cut. And that's not actually in a, in, a, in a human capital perspective, that's not something they're challenged with. What they're challenged with is handling the demand coming in, maintaining the staff that they've got, but then attracting new people in. And because of the, um, the demographic shift that I talked about earlier, and I'm sure everyone on this call will be aware of that, then that demand is significantly increasing. There are no more costs and there are no more revenue to increase the ability to recruit more people. So we've got to do things differently. And at one particular chief executive had said to me that he would need to, you know, if he was to project, you know, 15, 20 years ahead and doing nothing, he would need to recruit all of the school leavers in 15 years time to be able to come in and support the demand if they kept doing things the way that they're doing just now. And that's just not sustainable. So they are looking at RP for that very purpose. Take staff, redeploy them, do something much more valuable, give them a better work life experience, something that's um, that feels that it's more rewarding to those individuals and just let the bots do what they do behind the scenes. And uh, these guys get to pick up any of the anomalies that come out. So a bit of rambling from me really, um, but just really wanted to try and set a bit of a scene um, for the rest of the day. I'll come back and just finish off uh, once Nalan goes through these next two slides with you. So Nalan, I'll hand over to you. Yeah, thanks, Justine. Um, so I guess I, I wanted to start by just, um, you know, setting the context around the business case for automation. Um, you know, when when people think about automation, they often think about it, uh, you know, as a tool for reducing headcount, of course, and, and driving cost reduction in the business. Um, and of course, <clears throat> you know, it can be that, but, you know, as, as the slide shows, um, if you just move on to the next slide, Justine, um, <clears throat> um, there's a lot more to it. Um, yeah, that's the one. Um, so by, um, I guess, diverting human effort away from kind of repetitive rules-based, um, you know, activities and processes and uh, replacing that with um, robots, you can indeed, um, you know, uh, drive cost reduction, but you can also divert the effort onto more, much more kind of value add um, activities. Um, you know, those that require human judgment, um, decision-making, interaction, and perhaps create creativity as well. Um, and I guess in a health context, um, you know, put simply, this could be, you know, moving <clears throat> human effort from the 
to actually more patient centric and patient facing activities that can drive um, you know better experience and outcomes for for the patients um so actually you know there's a lot lot of merit in actually understanding and quantifying um both the financial and non-financial drivers across any enterprise and particularly um you know what the impact would be of changing the the levers around outcomes for patients um you know whether it's for experience generally or or reduced waiting times or you know better end-to-end -end kind of um you know integration of their data across different healthcare systems um or indeed through the offering of new services for patients as well <clears throat> um so uh, i guess just to summarize on this the, the first step really um is to have a clear view of the drivers for your organization um which will almost always be a combination of kind of you know financial and non-financial outcomes um now uh, <clears throat> i guess before we move on to the next slide what have uh, you know what we've also found important um when working with clients on this topic is um automation is one of the solutions and for, for you know for the benefits in the business case to really be maximized it's important also to kind of consider complementary activities which will support the automation um or indeed you know dictate that the automation may may not be the right answer um because you know if you think about any organizational process and you know if the goal is to make that process more efficient then you know this can actually be done in a variety of ways um you know you can simplify the process by removing steps by um removing levels of authority um you might be able to outsource the process and make it more efficient and effective in that way um you can also improve you know the quality of data that flows through and and is used in the process and you know you can change the channel of interaction that's used during the process um so i guess you know the key point here is that when you're thinking about um, a business case for automation, it's it is important to think holistically in in kind of a enterprise wide way and, and drive towards the right mix of solutions um, that are going to pull the levers that are most important for for your organization, which again could be a you know mixture of financial and non financial ones. Um, <clears throat> on the next slide, then um, Justine. Um, in terms of kind of business case for automation itself typically um you know it does it takes the form that's shown on the chart on the left whereby um you know if, if you focus on the dark shed, shaded area you will always have an upfront um you know net cost involved for for a period of time um and that relates to the effort involved in kind of upfront um readiness and selection of process for automation any infrastructure build required for automation. Um, and of course, there are also ongoing costs involved in, in running um, the automation, you know, automated process. But uh, the point is, if you select the right processes, then this cost will, uh, you know, be a, be a fraction of the cost of actually running the, the, the manual process um, it is replacing. Um, and of course, um, you know, there will be a break even point in, you know, a, a point in time where you can see the net benefits accruing. Um, once the fixed up kind of, uh, uh, you know, fixed up front costs have been fully recovered. And, um, you know, the point at which this break even occurs um, does depend also on selecting the right processes, how quickly the automation can be implemented in your organization. Um, how fast the ramp down in human effort can take place for those processes. Um, and, and this is often one of the key challenges, actually, the, the ramp down of human effort. You know, there's significant um, level of thought that needs to be given on the, on the culture of the organization. And, you know, we've certainly been involved in engagements where automation initiatives, you know, have been unsuccessful because, you know, the culture was such that asking staff to do other things was just not going to work and, and you know particularly is the case in some uh, public sector um, organizations and justine mentioned you know about the pace of change in the public sector and um so how do you you know how you deal with that is is certainly something um that is worthy of thought and consideration um for investment 
Um, it's of course, <clears throat> you know, also depends on factors that are taken into account in the business case. So often we find, you know, that it's just the direct financial impacts that are considered, but of course, there's a number of benefits such as um, reduction in errors, um, improvement in service, um, improvements in ability to meet regulatory and policy requirements, um, better satisfied and engaged staff, all of which <clears throat> may actually make a significant impact on, on the success of the organization and on patient outcomes. So I guess, um, you know, measuring success from automation it is tricky and there's a lot of moving parts, but ultimately it, it comes down to identifying, again, the drivers for your organization that are most valuable um, and the impact that automation has, has on, those, um, on those drivers. So um, I think that's all I wanted to cover at this stage in terms of automation, but of course, um, you know, happy to take questions and, and for people to reach out um, for any specific questions as well. So I'll pass back to uh, Justine at this point. You're on mute, Justine. Justine, I think you're still on mute. Sorry, thank you. I I think somebody must have put me on mute. I was uh, unable to get myself off when I was sharing my screen. I think the, the key thing really that um, Nalan and I wanted to kind of say as part of the, the discussion that we've had today is that the opportunities are fairly significant. You know, the, the if you look at it from a, a care perspective, if you're in a system, you know, the, the efficiency that you can get from engaging uh, in uh, in a fairly clever and not that uh, sophisticated because it can be as simple as you want it to be. You know, the benefits are there um, and absolutely they're there to be had. And the opportunity that it affords in terms of increasing capacity, improving um, the care that's provided and creating better work-life balance for the people that are actually providing the services in the system. Um, and I'm pretty sure as, as the process goes forward over the next couple of years with the partners that we're going to hear from today and that we already work with, that will become, you know, we, we're going to keep learning and there's going to be so much more value to be had in that. And I'm pretty sure, and again, just touching on the pandemic point, in a couple of years' time, we're going to look back and actually RP is just going to, going to become um, part of our usual working environment. Um, and we will get to a point where we forget that we didn't have it once upon a time. So hopefully that's just a little bit um, of help in terms of setting the scene today. Um, you know, I know from CGI's perspective that we are really looking forward to getting involved with the Northeast um, Tech Cluster um, and really, really excited to see how this starts to develop and evolve over the coming months and years. Um, we're keen to, to support that in any way that we can. And please do feel free to contact either uh, Nalan or myself. Um, Mark, I think, is, is on the call as well, and you, you'll hear from some others. I'm more than happy to take any questions. Um, but thanks again for having us. It's been really uh, lovely to speak to you, and um, I'll hand back uh, to Claire. Thank you so much, Justine, and thanks, Marlin. Um, yeah, just to pick up on your point, if you've got any questions for the panel, then please pop them in the Q&A or have some discussions in the chat. We'd love to hear from you. Um, we're going to come back around to Q&A at the end with all the speakers. So if you've got anything for a specific speaker, then please um, mark on the question who it's for. If they're more general, then we can pick them up um, as a panel. So we're going to dive straight into the first use case, and I'm going to welcome Isabel Stewart from CGI to talk about her um, project. She is the Director of Consulting of Delivery in Scotland. So Isabel, if you're there, if you'd like to come on. Yep, it's telling me I can't start the video. Okay, I'll get Claire to have a look at that one. Yeah. That, one. that looks like it now. Thank you very much, Emma. Um, now we'll share the screen. Is that coming through? 
We can't see your screens yet. No. no. It looks That's as though it's sharing. It's on now. That's okay, thank you very much. Um, as Emma said, my name is Isabel Stewart. I'm a director consulting delivery with um, CGI. I also have been with CGI for about three years. Um, and I work within the delivery centre, which is based in Glasgow. And I am leading the software development team within the delivery centre. So we have about 160 members, lots of architects. Um, I have mainly back-end Java and automation analysts. Uh, we also have emerging tech and we have uh, about half of the practice actually is test and test automation. So within mine, as I said, we have automation analysts and we work together with our colleagues from Bridgend to deliver um, automation to various places. Currently working in a, a big piece of work with Glasgow City Council and um, we have other contracts with other councils in Scotland and Scottish government that we're going to be um, doing future automation with. The one that I'm going to speak to you today, of course, would be healthcare, given the title of the presentation and the, the actual undertaking of today. So if I can move on. NHS Scotland, um, as Justine has mentioned, are keen to reap the benefits of automation. And we went in to have a chat with them, led by Justine. And I do the kind of follow up coming in behind to get into a bit more of the detail. Justine um, talks to them at high level and then we work out if there's anything we can do with them. So some of the background in NHS Scotland, uh, they've got 160,000 employees. So you would think that's all doctors and nurses. There's actually 25,000 of those are administrative staff. And many of the administrative staff are involved in what can be, and I, do, I did hesitate to write down mundane, but many of the tasks can be mundane and repetitive. So that is a very ripe area to look for automation. If you're looking at a person, then the skills and um, what they can bring to the workplace is their creativity and innovation. They can indulge in verbal conversation, um, showing emotion, compassion, they're capable of subjective thought, and they deal very well with unstructured information. Now these five are the five kind of um, attributes that set them apart from automation. So for automation, what we really need to find is structured work. So we can't have any kind of um, thought process involved in it, or a, if it does this, then it'll do that, or it could maybe do this. It needs to be a, if it does this, then this is the action. It's very, very good for repetitive tasks because it can then take um, repetitive tasks and without getting bored with them, because a person, you'll be interested to learn, I'm sure. If a person is, involved in any more than one hour of repetitive task, then you can expect about a 10% error rate, which is quite high. And given the type of work that can be going on, especially in health, you really don't want that kind of room for error. You really want it to be as accurate and consistent as it possibly can be. The robots are very good at logical processing. They don't actually have logic or not logic. They actually just have rules. So what we need to find are processes that are repetitive and rules based. And of course, the other very major bonus of using automation is they don't need to have training. They don't need to have toilet or smoke breaks. They don't need to have absences or leave. And they can, in fact, if the process is built with this in mind, work 24 hours, seven days a week. In my experience, there aren't very many processes that require that kind of level. So we always have to be very cautious when we're promoting automation, not to say that the robot can be three times more efficient or three times more productive than a person can be because they can work 24 hours in a day as opposed to eight days. Uh, as opposed to eight hours in a day. So just a little word of caution there. We have been caught out with that in the past. It really depends on the process. And if the process lends itself to 24 hour operation, 
then we can reap those benefits. So we went to speak to one of the big health boards in NHS Scotland. Um, and they, through discussion with Justine, um, identified an area that they thought automation would be a good fit for. And that area, as Justine mentioned earlier, is the GP referral process. Now, what happens for the GP referral process in this particular health board, and I'm sure it's almost exactly the same in many others or most others, certainly in Scotland, they're all pretty uniform. So the GP writes a patient referral, usually while the patient's sitting beside them in the, the consulting surgery, and it goes via a system called um, Sky Gateway, which takes it into Track Care, which is a patient management system used throughout the NHS in Scotland. The referral management team in that health board then check Track Care for any GP referrals coming in. They will then check the referral for accuracy and, and completeness. And then they will actually rekey the information that's sitting in Track Care onto the specialty waiting list. Now, you can imagine um, sitting for many hours in any given day, just reading information from one part of a screen and rekeying it into another system on the same or a second screen can be quite a tedious and doesn't really give you good, sorry, there's something flashing up on my screen, doesn't really give you um, a good a feeling about the work that you're doing and the contribution that you're making. So what we found the challenges were through discussion with the health board were that the large number of manual steps, so checking it, looking at it, moving the data, checking it, putting it into the right place, checking it again. And the process was very time consuming and as I mentioned, <coughs> error prone. And that of course led to a poor customer experience. We have many people who work in these kind of jobs and it's what they know their job to be and they go in and they do enjoy the completion of the task but if we could offer them the opportunity to do something that was perhaps more uplifting more challenging needed a little more thought then you would imagine that they would get more um, good customer experience from that so through discussion, um, we decided that if we were going to build a proof of value for the health board, that we should make sure that the scope of that was very tight. So we had two meetings and we looked at the very many GP referrals there are, and they basically come into either urgent or non-urgent. So obviously we elected for the slightly easier one, the non-urgent one, um, just in case. And we then decided that physiotherapy was probably a good one because they get through high volume of physiotherapy referrals on any given day. So that would give us a good um, number coming through that we could test the process against and give us better numbers to actually measure the effectiveness of the automation. So the methodology that we adopted um, we set up a kind of Agile-esque team and that would include CGI staff members and client staff members to work very collaboratively. So we made it clear right at the start with the health board that we would need a lot of time from their staff to enable us to fully understand what the requirements of this process were, what the challenges they were facing and how best to bring that all together and use automation most effectively to give them the best outcome. So for the CGI team, we had automation engineers or software developers by another name. In this particular proof of value, we actually used two. We used a senior engineer from the Bridge End uh, GTO team and we used one of our um, young apprentices. Uh, CGI are very, very good at making sure that they bring on young people. And in my team, I have seven 
uh, graduate level apprentices. So these are kids who have come usually straight from school into a modern apprenticeship. And then once they get through the modern apprenticeship, we take them into university and give them day release to go away and uh, do a, a, a BSc honours in software development. So we got one of the young lads to work alongside uh, the senior developer and that worked out very well for both of them because it gave us a bit of resilience when the senior developer had a family emergency, the young apprentice managed to step up to the mark. And using the, the same tool set was able to keep the process going, keep the project on track. The kind of key person in all of the automation, and in my view, certainly, is what used to be the business analyst. Within automation, that person and that role has grown a bit. So you definitely need the business analysis um, requirement gathering expertise uh, to tease out all the detail and get right down into the, the grassroots, into the nitty gritty of what the process is, where the gnarly bits are, where the quick win bits are, and how to get from as is to to be in the most efficient manner. We also had um, a functional tester, and I actually acted as the project manager in this one. Um, just out of, of uh, keenness to be involved more than anything else. And it was a very rewarding experience. From the client perspective, obviously, as I mentioned, um, Justine had engaged at the kind of top level of, of the health board management. We used the health records manager as our senior responsible officer. So he was there as an escalation point, but on a day-to-day -day basis, our automation analysts, automation engineers and testers were working with the subject matter expert and the product owner, who was in fact the manager of the referral management team. I kind of floated in every week, had a meeting with them, did all my checkpoints, kept all the documentation up to date and, and made sure that there were no blockers to the process going through. We had set it up to deliver it within six weeks and we managed to do that uh, on time and within budget, which was very rewarding, as I said earlier. And what we did was we developed and deployed a proof of value for non-urgent physio referrals. And if I can show you a bit more about the methodology. These are the stages that we look at. Now, you'll see these words here are kind of standard automation stage descriptors, but these words underneath are what they're also called. And this is what we were using in um, NHS because this is what the people were used to understanding. So the two I've listed here and they're kind of interchangeable. So the stakeholders down the left, the product owner was the lady who was the manager of the referral management team. The subject matter expert, was the manager within her, oh, sorry, the manager within her team who uh, was responsible for GP referrals. Our automation analyst uh, was a lady who was a senior BA and she kind of drove the whole thing forward. So as I said, I think they have a very, very critical role in any automation team and collaborative working. Solution architect also involved very early on and right through, as you can see the lines going across, solution architect, automation analyst, there's through just about everything. And the developer becomes engaged kind of halfway through once the analyst and the architect have identified the requirements and um, drafted up a solution. Testing was interesting because we had a tester there who was a standard software developer, a standard software tester for functional testing. But within automation, it's quite different because you're not sitting in front of an application with validations against each of the fields. You're sitting with test data and expected results and the kind of black box in the middle where the robot and the automation actually takes place is almost invisible to the tester. So what we have evolved through the last year or so is instead of having functional testers, 
that we work very closely, as I said, in an agile-esque fashion. So we do develop test. And the testing in this point is done by the automation analyst at kind of system test level, and then by the client tester at a user acceptance test. And again, the expectation has to be set early on. It will be develop, test, fix, test, fix, test, fix. And through very close collaboration, that can happen very quickly and it gives good results and it keeps everything moving very quickly and through into completion. And then what can be the very time consuming part of it is the acceptance into service. So that's the final part, the support, the manage part and into BAU. So I showed you a four stage process before automation. After automation, those four steps become improved service, sorry, and quality with the internal customer satisfaction. People get freed up to do higher value, more interesting ta tasks, and that boosts employee satisfaction. In this particular case, we did encounter a bit of a difficulty because the staff were very suspicious that the robots were going to be there to replace them and they were going to lose their jobs. So we built in um, two sessions uh, to do presentations. I have to say, we're not here to take your jobs. We're here to take away some of the more repetitive parts of your jobs to free you up to do the parts that need more brain power or more human interaction. We're here to give you back some time into your diaries and what really is time poor roles. They're all very, very busy. And after the first presentation, they kind of got it. By the time we had developed the robot and showed them that there were still going to be exceptions, they were still going to be required, they were a bit more comfortable and it made it easier to move on together with them instead of trying to pull them along behind us. We also obviously got more accurate data entry due to the reduction in the rekeying errors because lifting data from one part of a screen and rekeying it is a very error prone activity. And over time, a fully deployed system could result in cost savings. We're very careful about not promoting that because again, that kind of calls back to, they're going to get rid of me and bring robots in to do my job. So this is a, a message that you have to be careful about the delivery of. So we then had our proof of value and the next steps to build on that, there are many other GP referrals. So we will be working with this particular health board and we'll be looking at other GP referrals and reusing part of the code that we did for the physiotherapy ones. Um, and that's, that's the benefit of the uh, object-oriented development. So it's all broken down its smallest components and we can reuse a lot of that in other areas and where adaptations require its only a small piece of the, the original core software that needs to be changed. And during, um, the second of the two uh, presentations that we did to the staff, they started to come up, which was really pleasing, they started to come up with ideas for other areas that this could be implemented. Clinic cancellation was the one that everyone was in agreement would be a good candidate. And then the director of finance had heard, so he was very interested to come across and through a very short conversation, he was coming up with lots of ideas of, of where we might be able to implement automation for finance. Unfortunately, in this particular case, this all happened just a week before lockdown. So the final show and tell to all the other stakeholders, which would probably have spawned more interest, uh, didn't actually take place. So we're just waiting for all of their additional COVID activities to kind of settle down a bit before we re-engage with them. And I'm very sure that we'll finish up with this. This list will be very much bigger as more people are made aware of the benefits that we can bring through automation and not necessarily in reducing numbers, but in um, giving people some more time back into their diaries to do higher value work. 
That's the end of my presentation and I would like to thank you all very much for having the opportunity to show you this today and I'd be very happy to take any questions on it later or to discuss anything in any more detail. I'll hand back. Thanks Isabel, that was fantastic. Yeah. And um, yes, as I've said, if you've got questions for specific speakers or just generally, just please put them in the Q&A and we'll pick those up at the end. So we're well, moving swiftly on to our next use case. I'm going to welcome Patrick Stewart. Um, Head of Healthcare at Blue Prism and Graham Fletcher, C CIO of Connect Health, who I'm pleased to say is one of our health tech cluster members and a Dynamo member. So Graham and Patrick, over to you. Hey guys, um, Emma, first and foremost, it's Patrick Shepard, not Stuart, but I don't mind. I don't take offence uh, to that. I was, I was thinking of uh, Star Trek, wasn't I? Sorry about that. <laughs> yeah. No, it's fine. Honestly, I've been called worse things. I'm just going to uh, start my video to say hello. Um, I can hear the kids next door on Disney Plus, so the bandwidth is pretty terrible in Peterborough. So I'm going to go off video. But I'm just going to share my screen, um, and uh, I can see Graham there. Hey, Graham. Um, I'm going to run through just a few slides around who Blue Prism are, who Blue Prism Cloud are. Uh, but fundamentally, we want to hand over to Graham as soon as humanly possible, just to talk through the great work that he's done at Connect Health. So just bear with me. Let me stop my video and share my screen, and then I'll hand over to, to Graham. One second. Okay. Fantastic. Let me know when you can see my screen. Yep. Yeah, Graham, excellent. Yes, Great. So thank thanks you. very much for, for having us this morning. So a, a big thank you for Dynamo and, and CGI for, for allowing us to present today. My name is Patrick Shepherd. Uh, I'm the head of healthcare at Blue Prism Cloud, and I've been running the Blue Prism Cloud business for the last three years. It's been a hell of a journey. Uh, three years ago, you know, I remember walking into my first meeting with Royal Brompton uh, down in London talking about software robots deployed by the public cloud with AI and machine learning. I got that far and they kind of asked me to leave. Fast forward three years, we now operate, you know, in over 50 NHS trusts and Department of Health bodies, CCGs, ICSs, CSUs. It's been, a, it's been a, an amazing journey. And for those of you that, that don't know who Blue Prism are, um, we are a UK-owned, UK-based software organisation, and what we have is an intelligent automation platform that creates a pool of digital labour which emulates or mimics human beings in the workplace to help free up staff time. So ultimately, what we're doing is we're delivering, a, I guess, a step change in productivity uh, and starting to shift how work is executed across the, the health sector to, I guess, reduce risk, to enhance patient outcomes, and uh, I guess fundamentally to make staff happier. You know, both my in-laws are A&E nurses in Lincolnshire. The last few years of their career have been remarkably difficult. And I'm sure we, I'm sure lots of people know that, you know, across the NHS, there's a million pounds worth of overtime worked per week for free. If we can start to give time back to those people, see more patients, engage uh, more holistically across the sector, then that's only a positive thing for, for, for the NHS and the wider, and the wider um, ecosystem. So in terms of Blue Prism Cloud and what we do, I'm only going to spend a couple of slides, but I think it's worth just noting what Blue Prism Cloud do as an organisation. So Blue Prism Cloud, we are a software as a service. Uh, for those of you that aren't au fait with that term, uh, if you have Amazon Prime or Disney Plus or Netflix, they are software as a service offerings. So you don't have to worry about infrastructure, uh, we just deploy it as a service. And everything I talk about or we talk about is included in a one-off fee. But um, in terms of the three main components, we are powered by Blue Prism RPA, so frictionless deployment. It's um, you know as a, as a technology, it allows us to access any application in the front end, complete an objective process, and log out. So that's ERS, ESR, System One, Medway, Knos Evolve, Epic, whatever it might be. They log in and emulate the activity of a human being. The next two bits are probably the most important part. So as I mentioned, we are SaaS hosted. So uh, infrastructure is hosted in the cloud. It means that you don't have any hardware or any infrastructure to look after. But most importantly, it allows us to collaborate and share with other NHS organizations. Uh, and, you know, we've been very fortunate, uh, like Graham, for example, to share some of his automation, some from some of his learnings with other NHS organizations, which really delivers speed to value. So cloud is a massive part of our, of our strategy as an organization, the way that it's deployed, the way that we're able to share with other organizations just really drives that, that speed to value point. And the third thing, you know, AI, machine learning capability, it's a bit of a buzzword, 
It was a buzzword last year. It's certainly the buzzword this year. We use what we would call functional AI. So things like language translation, we can support 60 languages. We can read emails. We can read handwriting. You know, it's not as, as accurate as, um, as reading documents using optical character recognition, but it's, it's there. We have chatbot capabilities as part of the platform. So fundamentally, you know, we, are, we look to deliver our platform as a way of, of shifting the way in, in which work is executed, as I said at the beginning, using RPA, cloud, AI machine learning in a single package to deliver that outcome to, to our customers. And I think the most important point is that this is not an IT widget sat on a desktop in a siloed part of, a, of, of your organization. This is a strategic asset for, for your organization. So digital workers will move intelligently and dynamically across your business, maybe doing some accounts payable work, processing referrals, doing some e-outcoming, doing some new start and leave and mover processes in an intelligent and dynamic way. And I think that's really, really important to stress as a technology. So in terms of in terms of who we work with, I'm gonna I'm gonna hand over to Graham really in a second in terms of his case study because that's what we're all here for. But you know, we work with over 52 NHS organisations now. You know, if I just take a couple on here, uh, you know, Norfolk and Norwich, a relatively new customer, we've automated their their cancer two week wait automation to manage cancer referrals in its first month, which was only I think last month. Um, there was over 5,000 cancer referrals that were processed by the digital workers. That took 32 hours for a robot to do. It would have taken 10 weeks of FTE time. So that automation was rolled out quickly. They're seeing benefit. It's processing cancer referrals, which has a massive impact on staff and patients. Uh, Kettering are on here. They became a client six, seven weeks ago. The daily COVID sit rep um, process that everyone has to do. I think it's by 11 a.m. every day to basically work out using uh, health roster which which members of staff are off with COVID, which members of staff are not off with COVID but are still off, uh, and then report that up to NHSE. That process is now live. It will save 4,400 hours of time, which equates to around 153 grand. So there's a massive, massive impact with COVID and how we automate. The Royal Free are on here, they reduce time to hire by five days, automating some HR and finance processes. And uh, obviously referrals was mentioned a second ago, we process referrals or GP referrals with ESNEF, Royal Free, Morecambe Bay, Leeds Teaching, Older Hayer building it at the moment, and there's a number of others. In terms of the Northeast, um, for those of you that are eagle-eyed, there's a few organizations that we are very, very lucky to work with in the Northeast. Uh, County Durham and Darlington, uh, Gateshead, NHS Business Services Authority, obviously Connect Health, uh, and the Care Quality Commission. Uh, and in terms of the CQC, just quickly, the thing that we've automated there is the notification of, of deaths in care homes. So, you know, back in March, April, when, you know, it was all over the news every day, Matt Hancock was getting some fairly uh, testing questions from Piers Morgan on Good Morning Britain around how many people have, have unfortunately passed away in care homes. The, the frank and stark reality was that we just didn't have enough people to process the, those numbers and input them into the ONS to feed those up to government. That process has now been automated by, by our digital workers. So again, processes that didn't exist before, processes that were BAU, but have now become more prevalent with COVID, we are, we are already automating within our organizations. And the last slide from me, you know, I talked about it a second ago, we as an organization, because we are, because of the way in which we deploy, because of the way in which we want to, 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 to engage with, with the NHS and the healthcare system, we allow organizations to share uh, automations for free via the NHS marketplace or the NHS digital exchange. So, you know, one very brief example is, you know, Colchester Hospital shared their COVID antibody testing with Norfolk and Norwich. It took three days of a little bit of tweaking to get that up and running. And now that's live. Dorset and Morecambe Bay also started using that process. And, um, you know, Norfolk and Norwich are now extending this to manage antibody testing for, for elective patients. So the ability as organisations join the, I guess, the, the club, I guess, the ability to share automations and share best practice is really important. So I guess this is probably the key takeaway here that from an organisational point of view, we are delivering change right now. We're a safe pair of hands. We know exactly what we're doing. We engage with the with the NHS at, at various levels, and obviously we give we give organisations the capability to share and collaborate with one another. So just to hand over, sorry, Graham, if that was a minute over, I'm just going to hand over to yourself now. I'm just going to stop sharing and let you talk about some of the great work that you've done at Connect Health. Thank you. Okay, cool. Thank you, Patrick. Just bear with me. Let's 
He's kind of fucking running. Right. Everybody see that? Yes. Um, right. So I'm going to give you a very whistle stop tour of our journey in Connect Health in terms of automation. And, and we use the phrase automation a lot more than we use the phrase robotics. Um, simply because of the, the, you know, the connotations that we talked a little early before that I think it's a really interesting point about culturally getting people used to the idea that what we're doing is bringing you additional workforce to work with you. And, and in our case, it's never about replacing people. It's about um, enabling people with more firepower than they've got today and, and allowing them to do more value add. So I think that's, uh, you know, quite an important facet of, of what we need to cover a little bit, really. Um, I think the key thing to just be aware of is, you know, Connect Health, we're, we're a 30 year old organization. We are a private organization, but we are not a sort of Bupa type organization. We are um, predominantly work in the MSK space and we, and we take most of our, our work through from NHS. We have um, 26 CCGs. We work with hundred plus businesses in our OHS side of the business. And we serve about 330 NHS patients per annum. Um, you know, our kind of, skill I think is that we, we are because we're predominantly MSK plus some of the things and we, we are geographically all over the country we've got a massive wealth of, of experience of how we can do things and, and every time we bring a new contract in we can sort of bring best practice because of the sheer scale um, the, the sheer scale of us gives us data as well we, we've got more data on on MSK than probably anyone else we believe in the world although that's unverified um, so, so why automation? I think the, you know, the points will be repeated in several channels, I think, throughout this session. But um, I think the reality is that, you know, increasing demand for, for resources, constantly outstripping supply. You know, we, we, we grow that fast and there is that much, you know, work to do and that many patients to serve that we can never have enough people. So, you know, why, why continue to try and add more and more people to do low value tasks when we can do something automatic with them? Um, a really key thing for me, I've been with Connect two years, and a key thing that struck me, I've never had, I've never been in a health tech sort of world, the lack of native integration with some of the big systems out there, you know, like System One and things that are, that are prevalent. You know, you can't just pick up the APIs and crack on. They, they just either don't exist or they're not available to communities like us. So having a way to get data in and out of those systems and, and do stuff was a, a really big driver. Um, Lots of manual complex processes, lots of human error, you know, when, when, you're, when you're processing that many records and, and, and the sort of throughput we've got. People make mistakes and it's natural and you can see them getting more tired through the day. You know, the mistake rates go up during the afternoon. Um, so we, we thought, let's try and do something about that. Um, and I think the other thing really is about that, you know, that the bigger we got and the more we did, that the more resource we needed. We, we you know, we're just gonna have to keep moving buildings and, and growing all the time. So I do that. So we decided not to. Um, th these are the things that we've already done. I mean, we've, we've been automating, we probably went live about a year ago. So, so this sort of is our, is our journey in the last 12 months, which the, the more I look at it, it kind of blows my mind a little bit about what we've, we've managed to do. But um, referrals was our first use case. So registrations and referrals, um, you know, very similar to the previous one. The, the key thing we had with that is that we, we have, you know, from 26 CCGs, we have goodness knows how many different types of referral forms and how many different flavors of things that GPs have done, which I'll touch on a bit later because I don't think we've foreseen quite how complicated that would be. Um, patient communications, we, we have automated um, a ton of stuff around sending out care plans and, and you know lots of other types of stuff through our HCC platform. Um, intelligent interaction with patient records, we, we've built in a ton of sort of safety checks in where, where you know we have automations now kind of doing a bit of an audit you know effectively running through the records checking for different you know issues before we will discharge whereas in the past we might have had humans missing something and discharging when, when they shouldn't have done um, so we've baked that into to handle things in a, in a more rigorous way data migration has been a big thing for us one, one of the things that struck me when i arrived is that if we win a new contract and the incumbent is running on emis or some other system and we get we want to get them in system one at the time, we used to have to hire temps, like tons of them, to, to effectively ac extract the data from one system and type it into system one because of the things we said before. Um, so one of the really you know, key ones that we wanted to automate was that and, and using 
um, Blue Prism and automation as a way to do it has, has helped solve that. We, you know, we can we can automate the data migration, which we just couldn't do because there isn't an API for it. Um, the digital physiotherapy pathway, we've got lots of different things that we're building in now. We've got um, a, a different triage tool called PhysioNow, which is a, a sort of third party um, digital triage, basically. It's a decision tree based thing. Um, and we've been able to automate all of the interaction with that with System One in the same way. Um, I'll come back to, I'm not going to go through all the use cases actually, because you can read the slides later at your leisure. Um, I think a little bit to just quickly cover off here is, is how we do the automation in the in the patient pathways cycle. It's very similar to the to the previous case a little bit in that we you know get our referrals from ERS, um, we get them through from telephones, we get them through online self serve, and we get through from consultants. Um, what we automated first is is taking the ERS referrals. So so we basically take the referrals out of ERS. We handle about. 20 different types of referral forms, which was probably unforeseen. We would have preferred it if they were all the same, but I guess we didn't understand it well enough at the time. And we basically take those through, we, we pull it, all the detail through, we register it into system one. Um, we then basically do what we need to do with the patients. We treat them, um, the RPA picks up the clinical outcomes and generates a task list. And, and basically decides from there what needs to be done. And, and you know, it doesn't, it doesn't make any, any key medical decisions because clearly that wouldn't be something that we'd want to get into. But where there are basic conditions that are fairly binary in terms of decisions, it will, it will pass the records to the right place. Um, when we're finished and the patient cares, done, and, and we are comfortable that we're finished with them. As I say, in some of the early processes I mentioned, we will, we will run sort of automated discharge based on the 13 point checks that are, baked in and, and if our if our automation platform or, or any of the robotics if they're just not sure our default is really quite simple if, the, if there's anything at all that deviates from the path we taught them they just immediately hand back to humans because clearly that's what you would want um, but I think that touches on another lesson that we can we can pick up on a little later um, so what are the benefits I mean these are our sort of stats so far and, and I think you know we've, we've barely scratched the surface really so um, we've saved about 5,000 hours of, of, of person time, which is 5,000 hours that we can spend talking to patients because we wouldn't have had more time for that. Um, we've registered 35,000 patients and the reason it's not 330,000 is because we've had to ramp our way up through the contracts. You know, we, we, we've had to build a contract at a time. We couldn't just do all of them on day one because they're different. Um, we've done 11,000 um, data migrations, 20,000 patients discharged. Um, 6,000 digital communications and 1,000 clinical outcomes processed. But as I see, you see from the day, it's quite a lot of these are quite recent. So, so these are now all just going to keep giving benefit year on year, all day, you know, 24 seven, these are now built and they just, you know, continue. Um, it's helped through COVID because we've, where we've, where we've had pinch points with people and, and, you know, in the middle of trying to sort of get everybody to work from home and stuff the you know the automatic the automatic platform and the virtual workers have just kept going so you know they've not been disrupted by any of that and as patrick said one one of the benefits of, of when we went blue prism was we wanted to get a platform as a service i, I didn't my, my strategy is entirely cloud-based i don't put tin in if i can help it so we, we just basically got everything out of the box in the cloud sitting in a microsoft azure framework and, and it's just you know chugged along in the background which has been good Oh man, sorry, let me go, previous, I don't know why one clicks take me through, oh. stop going back. Right, lessons learned, I'll quickly cover off them and, and then I'll, I'll let you move on. Um, key lessons for us, I just wanted to share this because there's some really important stuff I think everyone should think about if they're going on an automation journey. When we set off, we worked on a principle that we just automate everything as it was and, that, and that's something we'd you know, heard from, from someone else who'd done this. Um, my, my answer is yes, you could do that, but I would take more time to understand what it is before you do that. So in the case of referral forms, we thought we had a standard form that was pretty much the same across all the services. Um, and our business thought that, but it turned out that wasn't actually true. So, so we ended up having to build multiple versions of the same thing. Um, we're now retrofitting a more standardized form so that, so that we can get better success because there's, there's lots of variables that come through. Um, really key to understand that you're never going to be able to automate 
and I think you know we, we're more cautious with our with our sort of what we say at the start of each automation now we work on a 50 percent principle from day one with it with a view to getting up to 80 percent whereas we probably started saying we could we could automate 80 percent and there'd be there'd be not a lot more to do um you know there's just just something about being really clear about what you can control and, and managing that and accept the fact that you're going to need people to handle the exceptions you know things that are more complicated that don't you know like a form where somebody's ticked the wrong box or written all over it there's only so much um you know visual recognition that the system can do um similar to the thing below there really so realistic benefit thresholds i think you know start with it you'll be ambitious don't start with 20 percent you know but but we we should we shoot for 50 from day one and then move up to 80 within a month or two and continually refine once you see what the real world shows you especially with external forms you can then teach them to do something different um thorough scoping similar message really just just take a little more time to understand the business process probably better than the business does themselves because they've never had to do it unless anyone's done a full time in motion study and understood it inside out um they won't know it as well as they think they do so so take a little time to get that right um scheduling efficiently is, is useful i think that is something that we, we are working obviously more and more with that, with the platform to make sure that we've got all of the workforce pointing at the right things at the right time because 24 7 is available and and just because that's not how your business used to work doesn't mean it isn't how your robots can work um and i think the last point you know again really important is is work in conjunction with the business it's not an it system it is a it is a set of virtual workers that you are providing to the business unit and, it, and it's up to them to you know effectively come in and do the induction and teach the robots you know what, what to do albeit via my team um, and then work really closely with the business teams i mean you know we've got we've got areas where some of the teams have nicknamed you know one of the virtual workers they nicknamed them robbie obviously for Robbie the robot. So they, they just and they literally talk about well, Robbie did 300 registrations last night. So um, I think it's really key to, to, to differentiate this as a set of work. It's digital workers rather than a technology platform. Um, that's my contact details. Obviously, you know, feel free to, to get in touch and ask me questions later. Okay, I'll try to make up a little bit of time, although I appreciate we are running over. So. No problem, Graham. That was fascinating. And thank you, Patrick. Really, really good. And thank you for sharing those um, lessons learned at the end. Really important to see those, I think. Um, so in the interest of time, we're going to canter on, if you will, um, onto our next presentation. Um, so we're going to wel welcome Matt Hogarth from UiPath. Um, unfortunately, Liz from NHS England couldn't join him today as she's feeling unwell. So sending her all the best. Um, Matt, I'm going to hand over to you now if you're ready. Thank you. I appreciate the, um, the the invite today. I'm really keen to highlight some of the work we've done in the northeast and are, are continuing to, to do. I think um, you know I'm Matt Hogarth and, and I cover the public sector for the north and, and whilst today's conversation is mainly around healthcare. I, th I think it's important that we start to try to bring health and social and the public sector together. And, and it's great to see an environment like this where, where we can maybe collaborate a bit more. And that's not just on your side. I think it's important that um, all three particular vendors on in this case, you know, the leaders in automation also come together um, and give you the choice of, of, of a, you know, how do we take it forward in the region? So excited to be here. I've got a slight connection with the Northeast in the fact that my uh, sister-in-law is an OT under Northumberland. So I've always had a passion for, for trying to make a difference. And I've never worked anywhere where you can actually make such a, a, a difference to the working environment as in this, this space at the moment. So really exciting times. I think recently a comment from a customer struck with me and it's actually NHS SBS, obviously not based in the Northeast, but it's easy for people to play with RPA. And I probably made this mistake when I first come on board at UiPath. It all felt very easy and we can do this and we can turn it on overnight, but it's easy to play. We can put a button on our machine and, and we'll see some benefits personally, but actually take a step back, look at the large scale impact that automation can have have a clear plan. And, and the biggest thing for me is it's a journey. 
you know, and, and I think Graham's presentation previously highlighted that you start somewhere, but it, it's a journey that you go on. And, and I guess, you know, pick someone that's going to go on the journey with you, get the right cultural fit, get the right organisation that suits you. You know, we, we're slightly different. We're a partner centric organisation at UiPath. We kind of maybe give too much choice to the customer sometimes in the fact that if you can want it, you want the solution on prem, that's fine. You want it in the cloud, that's fine. You want it in the UiPath cloud, the NHS England cloud, and and sometimes that can give you too much choice. But I think that's how that's how we work, um, and we'll work to your your plans. Um, lots of talk of RPA, intelligent automation, and now hyper automation, which is a word that I think we we've, we've created. Um, but what I think um, we've lost Matt. We'll try and get him back up on again in a minute. Russ, if I can just ask if you, would you be ready to come up on stage? Yeah, that's fine. That's fine, Emma. I can do that. Fabulous. Okay. Um, so up now from Automation Anywhere, we've got Russ Borum. He's a senior account manager for healthcare. And Neil Picton coming from Newcastle um, upon sign Hospital NHS Foundation Trust. Yeah. And he is the head of workforce engagement and information. So thank you very much, guys, for jumping in. And over to you. No problem. Hope, hope we can get Matt back online. And uh, hopefully everybody can see my screen now. Can you see that? Yes, we can see you. Brilliant. OK, so um, so in the interest of keeping it short, I'm, uh, I'm not going to kind of bombard you with slides. I, I think you know what I would like to do is is give Neil the spotlight. Really, um, automation anywhere is you know we're we're in the top right hand corner of all the magic Gartner quadrants and, and all of that good stuff. And there's a there's a lot of kind of me too that I feel might happen during this conference. So uh, I'll try and play down that a little bit. Uh, and what I wanted to say really is um, just tell you a quick story about why we're we're kind of working in the NHS and what it means to me. Um, I, I was very lucky that um, I got to spend a bit of time on a, on a large digital transformation program working with NHS Blood and Transplant previously. And the, the way that the entire program worked was around automating um, the way that all potential organ donors were matched with organ recipients. And it really opened my eyes to what's possible with this kind of technology in the NHS. And uh, I was lucky that we worked on that program for about three years and it always absolutely blew me away that the way that they measured the success of a program was every time someone came in and said yeah we can save you money we can do this we can do that and they always said that's great that's wonderful but the way that we were measuring the success of this is, is not around that it's around how many more lives will we save this year compared to last year and that was it for me i was completely hooked um, and I decided at that point that I wanted to spend my career helping the NHS to adopt these kinds of new and emerging technologies. And, and that was the reason that I joined Automation Anywhere. Um, and we're, our, our approach to this really is to build a community. So uh, we're working closely with Neil and his team at Newcastle. Um, and what we're doing is, is getting trusts to work together, whether it's regionally, nationally, uh, we're building out an ecosystem that will allow them to, to benefit each other. Um, so you have access, for example, to a full online university. Um, you've got access to, um, I think uh, Blue Prism mentioned earlier, digital exchange. We have, it's kind of a me too thing, we have one too. Um, and there's, there's a whole host of things that are going on to help people to engage and work together and, and actually get this up and running. Um, and we're starting to see now collaboration between trusts in, in regions, in STPs, in, in integrated care systems, both in the NHS and across into local government, um, both locally in acute hospitals as well as in community health. Um, and it's, it's fantastic to see. Um, that's all I really wanted to share. Um, we can go into details around automation anywhere and who we are if anybody's interested, um, but I'll, I'll hand over to Neil um, and he can tell you a bit more about the work that they're doing at Newcastle. Oh, thank you, Russ. Yeah, I'm just going to share my screen for a few slides uh, at this end as well. Just bear with me a second. Okay, can everybody see that? Okay. 
Great, I'll, um, I'll carry on from there. Okay, US, so thank you for the introduction. Uh, my name is Neil Picton. Uh, I'm Head of Workforce Engagement and Information here at uh, Newcastle upon Tyne uh, Hospitals Trust. Uh, I, within my um, areas of responsibility, look after recruitment, temporary staffing, rostering, uh, workforce information, volunteers, and staff engagement. I guess, in a nutshell, using systems and workforce uh, related data to enhance the way we work, enhance our staff engagement, and you know, ultimately make the NHS the best possible place to work. So, as Russ mentioned, uh, um, I introduced RPA into our organisation around 12 months ago. Uh, we've got over 14,000 staff. We're one of the biggest teaching hospitals in the country. Uh, we're a double outstanding rate organisation with a, with a, over a billion pounds annual turnover. So we're, we're a big trust. So uh, the, the prospect of using RPA, you know, from an economies of scale perspective uh, was, was really inviting for us. Um, today, I, I very much want to just focus on uh, the, a specific use case. I think we've, we've more than covered uh, with the other fantastic presentations uh, just around, you know, the reasons, the need for change. And I think I just want to put a little bit more focus on within my uh, 50 minutes just around, um, you know, what do we actually use it for? How do we identify that, that specific use case and what benefit has it realised for the trust in the organisation? Um, I think just before I do that in, in for, you know, for 10 minutes, it might just be useful to give a little bit of background context um, just on, for example, the need for change. I think it's really important that we do understand uh, the need for change within our own businesses and how automation can deliver tangible improvement. Um, just to understand how it's going to be embedded within uh, the business, not only to streamline processes, but also, uh, you know, as it was mentioned previously, around enhancing the culture uh, or, you know, and the experience of our staff and people. Um, understanding the importance of working collaboratively. You know, the NHS uh, is, is absolutely the right landscape to, to be doing that successfully. Uh, sharing our innovations and others uh, to co-evolve and accelerate automations uh, and developments. So, you know, I'm just clicking through here. You can see just to demonstrate my limitless creative abilities, I've used a road to uh, demonstrate our journey. You know, very, very original. But again, you know, the need for change is there. Uh, the need for change very much harnessed by the people plan from an NHS perspective. Um, you know, a, a great emphasis on harnessing technology and collaboration to transform our services. Uh, a strong emphasis on transformation and sustainability, how we're going to use innovation to meet the growing demands uh, on our services with diminishing budgets. We all have that, you know, um, that element of cost improvement pressures, how are we going to deliver more for less? Um, but most importantly, especially within the, the newly released people plan, uh, is around staff engagement. How do we make the NHS the best possible place to work through enhancing staff engagement and experience? So I think, um, you know, RPA offers itself as a viable solution for a number of those aspects, uh, which is why you know we, we considered this uh, as a solution that we could bring into the business. So implementation and training, um, again, the next stop was our, our first live bot, uh, and again, collaborative automation at the end of that. I do want to just put a little bit more focus around the implementation and training very, very quickly, because first we had to implement a better model that would utilize our existing resource. Um, but whilst also ensuring that we maximise the benefits in terms of value for money uh, and return, return on investments to the organisation. We were very mindful, you know, my position, my role within a, in a human resources perspective, that we took a people-centred approach using the centre of excellence model, uh, engaging and upskilling networks of creators, uh, trained and using the tools uh, to en enhance their business processes. We always use this phrase here around giving the hammer to the people who know where the nail is, this isn't just a, a select few that have access to this and everybody else gets in a queue uh, and hopefully they get their uh, get their wishes uh, turned into reality at some point. This is around expanding that network and expanding the potential and scalability across the whole business. Um, so, so that in itself, just to run through, I, I noticed a little pop up before around around data security as well. And so we, we've established through our bottom implementation group process uh, a deep um, uh, checklist, which obviously we have buy-in from our information governance and IT security teams. So they, they, they formulate part of that approval process to ensure from a data security and data sharing perspective that's embedded within that within that process. Um, so we, we ensure that from a buy-in perspective that we had the right people on board with us as a team uh, from the very start. Uh, just to give you a very bit of con a little bit of context around project delivery, um, you know, we just approach this as an organisation through a sustainability and transformation project, very much a standard, uh, you know, Prince2 delivery. 
um, the, the, we, we used a training program that uh, Automation Anywhere helps support, uh, not just face-to-face -face classroom based to get our initial cohort of, of staff trained, but also uh, fantastic online uh, tools and resources through their, through their learning university, which we continue to use uh, as we expand our training program locally. Uh, again, this federated model, this centre of excellence model to support growth, starting small but thinking very much bigger uh, and how that sustainably can, can, can grow across, uh, not just from, uh, from background uh, and, and more risk averse examples like we started with, but now into clinical areas as well. Uh, this was just part of our business case that we populated. And again, for any other, uh, I, I, I have a business case template if anybody's in that position where they'd like to discuss, you know, going through that business case process. Um, you know, I, I've got a template that I'm more, more than happy to share with anybody as well. So hopefully that may be useful for some people who are starting that journey as well. Um, so that, that's very much the, the background to it. And as I say, what we're in a position now, when we did launch, we created a bot implementation group, uh, which you know, harnesses the, the creativity of the, of the wider network, but it creates a central point of governance and control and quality assurance uh, from, from, from the middle. And we use this very simple pathway to ensure that whatever's going and being committed through the design process uh, has gone through the right measures of um, you know, feasibility, return, uh, return on investment assessments and things like that. So, so we're very happy with, the, with how we've evolved that process over a number of months. Uh, I probably should have said at the start that we, that we committed to um, uh, RPA at around uh, June last year, so we've just come across, you know, come over our 12-month uh, duration working with RPA, and we feel like we've achieved a great deal within that time. Although we are, we are even more excited about what the next uh, six to 12 months holds for us here. So I do want to, as I say, you know, jump into the kind of the the more valuable detail around what what we've actually achieved. Um, so our first live robot, we had to identify a process uh, that would enable us to advertise the benefits of RPA across the entire business and not just benefit the few. Um, so just a very quick background on, the, on this. Within the NHS, as I said, we've got 14,000 staff. Every, every single one of our members of staff uh, has an annual appraisal. Uh, as part of that appraisal, it's, it's a very valuable conversation that, uh, you know, that discusses, uh, I've been plunged in the darkness, give me two seconds. Um, there we go. Um, so, so those appraisal conversations are very important uh, in a mandatory part of our uh, management responsibility as well. Uh, as part of that process, there's a very frustrating um, uh, previous process that, that, that needs the manager to input the outcomes of that appraisal into our um, centralised workforce management system, which is an Oracle-based product called uh, ESR, Electronic Staff Record. Uh, it's it's not a great system. It's 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 not very intuitive, and it, from a user experience perspective, it, it, there's, there's a lot of problems with that. So we identified straight away that, that there was around 20 minutes per process um, taken um, by each manager every time they need to input that information within within the system. It's very unnecessary. We identified the fact that you know if that was if that was 20 minutes across the board across 14,000 staff, that's over 4,000 hours of management time committed to an administrative task that RPA could really help us with. For us to be able to achieve that, um, we we first of all understood the need, uh, and it was mentioned previously around the standardisation and structure of data coming in uh, for RPA to work with. So what we did to help support not just the appraisal outcomes, but subsequently three further key HR processes was the creation and launch of our internal HR portal. So what this would uh, serve to provide us with is that structured data so RPA could work seamlessly with the information that came out of it. From a version control perspective, it means we've only got one version of this form. We, we're not having to deal with high levels of variation of old PDF forms or Word documents that you know have you know, various different versions saved on local local hard drives. This very much satisfies the requirement to let's give us the data in a, in a format, in a, in a structured way that RPA can really excel with. So that was turned around internally very, very quickly. And as I say, establishing those uh, strong relationships internally with, between uh, those who are delivering RPA elements and your IT development teams as well, and your IG uh, and IT security teams is essential and it's worked very, very well for us. So that in itself helps us to launch uh, our appraisal. This was our very first appraisal outcome form, which went live in March. Um, and it's, uh, this basically takes between 20 and 30 seconds, as opposed to the 20 minutes it takes a manager to navigate their way through ESR to populate the information in the right way. So it's very, 
it's a good form uh, and what we've done is we've used a bit of innovation in the background to use and utilize and make benefit of our existing data warehouse connection with ESR. So we have a daily extract that runs from ESR into uh, our uh, data warehouse, which gives us up to date staffing information. So we can create these forms which tap into that real time information from a staffing perspective. So when you put in an employee number, it can automatically pre-populate your uh, job title, your name and your email address uh, uh, automatically. So that in itself uh, then led to, um, again, that appraisal email. The, the, the lovely thing about RP is it's not just the input of the information. It then seamlessly goes, once it's finished the input, it goes to the email system, sends out a nice email both to the appraiser and the appraisee, uh, almost as a transactional receipt to say, it's been done uh, on your behalf. Uh, this, is a, this is a transactional receipt of what's actually been uh, put into the system, which is really nice because, you know, formally, uh, the appraisee never really got to know what was actually input into the system, even though they would have been informed of that in the conversation. So it almost kind of enhances the original original process from an experience perspective for the appraisee as well. So, as I say, 14,000 staff, average of 20 minutes per, per employee. Um, we've had such a phenomenal uh, you know, set of feedback from, from this individual process. Um, you know, some of the Sometimes it feels like sometimes it's the straw that breaks the camel's back. It may feel like quite a trivial, uh, trivial process, but the positive impact it's had on managers who are already hugely pressurized, just taking away one of those unnecessary administrative tasks and giving them that time back, you know, in many cases, time back to care for patients. Uh, it's been a hugely powerful example for us to start with here in Newcastle hospitals. Not just that initial time release for, uh, for managers, but also second and third wave benefits. So just very, very quickly, um, what that's meant is because the original process of managers inputting into ESR was so convoluted, over 35% of the time, managers were inputting the information incorrectly, which meant that as a result, uh, pay progression and incremental um, queries were being generated at, at the back end of it, which are a separate team that was creating a cottage industry of, of pay queries that had to be picked up by our HR administration team. So by fixing the data quality going in, standardizing the information coming uh, coming into the system and RPA running at, at a 0% error rate, um, we've been able to also eliminate the increment queries out the back end of that, uh, which also leads to a higher um, uh, pay, uh, uh, a lower, certain lower pay errors. And, and, and it's, it's actually going to enable us to automate uh, the increment process itself. So it's not just about that first wave of, of time release benefits, it's also around the data quality impact further downstream as well. Um, just a, a quick point there about PP10 uses less than 1% uh, of its overall capacity to process all of the trust's uh, staff appraisals. We've we've increased that now to around 78% with, with, with further forms, but I guess the biggest challenge that we're faced with now is giving the robots enough work to be to be working to as high capacity as possible, and that's a great challenge to have. It's just around us, you know, being focused very much on the next on the next stages of, of our developments uh, here, which I'll come on to in a second. In terms of data metrics and benefit realization, the beautiful thing around RPA is just how easy it is to capture those benefits because everything's you know very much transactional based. We're very it's very easy to put a time measure uh, across the units that it's dealing with, and then pull those in very much into uh, our dashboards, which then again feed into our ROI summaries. This is an old an old snapshot just to give you an idea of how we uh, provide this summary back to our exec comms and, and exec boards to, to give them assurance that we're getting value for money out of the, out of the, uh, out of the process and that we're taking live. Um, just before I talk very briefly at the end about uh, you know collaboration uh, across across the patch, um, we've now approached uh, three thousand hours of time from the from the automations that we've got live. So we've subsequently gone through our HR portal released um, a moving and handling assessment form, uh, a local induction and a probationary form. We're very close to launch our levers form as well because we know there's significant benefits um, in processing levers in a timely and automated way as well as informing other key stakeholders of, of, of uh, staff that are leaving the business to avoid any overpayments and, and, and loss of um, and, and loss of income around that process. I know that's a, a big problem uh, across the wider NHS as well. So we're, we're very, very pleased to be tackling that, that one very, very shortly. We're just about to launch next week, starting from Monday. Uh, RP is going to be um, dealing with the reporting of our flu vaccination campaign uh, for compliance across and also providing 
external information to GP practices. Uh, so again, very excited about the launch of that next week. Uh, we've just completed our first clinical process, which is within our Dendrite Cath Lab system, uh, which is creating a consultant admin time for patient information going into uh, the Dendrite system uh, in cardiothoracic. Uh, and we're also working with our cancer information team uh, on the two week referral process, which I know uh, was mentioned earlier where trusts have already tapped into that opportunity and where we're very much looking forward to releasing that as well. So we're at 3000 hours of time release so far. We, we have plans to release 10,000 hours before the end of uh, March uh, next year, which we're very, very confident about achieving because uh, you know that the, the more process that come on board, uh, the more that uh, time release um, grows exponentially. Um, so we know that we're, we're going to be making some great grounds over, over the coming months as well. From a collaboration perspective, it, it has been uh, extremely positive working with uh, Automation Anywhere as our provider. Um, uh, we've been linking them very strongly with you know, regional organisations and national events uh, with Shelford, uh, just to ensure that we are all working together to progress um, RPA uh, as a whole uh, and sharing our learnings and supporting each other. This is not an opportunity to start ring fencing and, and getting tribal around progress as an individual organisation. This is a huge opportunity to be working closer together uh, and making sure that we are we are uh, accelerating uh, the, the, the huge potential across the NHS as a whole. Um, again, you know, we're very much um, in that space around being able to and offer uh, all the work that we've done from a sharing perspective across spot stores, uh, etc. And, and again, that's very much our stance uh, here at Newcastle Hospitals that we are, you know, hopeful that we can we we can de develop those uh, partnerships further. Um, accelerating developments through collaborative roadmaps, uh, which we which we've talked about, and again, working with a with a provider that that shares those same ambitions is very very important to us. Um, but I think you know, overarching, regardless of the of the system supply and provider. This is just around understanding uh, and working together uh, to pro progress things as, as best we possibly can. So hopefully that's been useful to you in terms of the detail around our specific very first automation and the positive impact it's had on the business. Um, and uh, you know, more than happy to take any questions as I'm plunged into darkness once more, clearly not being animated enough. Uh, but I'll end it there and hopefully that's not been uh, too long. Thanks very much. Thanks very much, Neil, and thank you for um, being so open, sharing your experiences with us. It's really appreciated and, and, a, and a great place to end on that point about collaboration across the NHS, which is something that we're all keen to do more of. Um, now, I'd like to welcome Matt back. He's back online now. So, Matt, if you're ready, I can hand back over to you once more. Thank you. Apologies there, guys. I was obviously in uh, flow and, and lost you there. So, yeah, apologies. Um, look, I, I think you're getting the flavour now for the whole journey with all the vendors and, and, and all the partnerships and hopefully the collaboration that we can put in place. So let's talk about the North East in particular and, and where you IPATH are operating in the North East. And, and, you know, the, the doors are open to collaborate, as Neil said previously, with anybody. Uh, but we, one of our biggest customers is, is North of England CSU Next. Um, and we recently went live with the national screening, cervical screening. What we're doing there is, is the heavy lifting, a, a lot of the admin tasks. This is not, uh, you know, there's no AI involved. We're not making any decisions at this stage. It's just around invitation letters, results letters, and connecting with 82 NHAs environments and, and making sure that actually, whilst we're also releasing capacity for the staff, we, we're actually, I guess, increasing compliance and the patient experience is improving because of the automation processes we're putting in place. You know, as I said, the robot is not making critical decisions at this stage, that they are still left to the humans. But there's a lot of lifting and shifting of, of the actual admin tasks. And I, I'd reach out to, for you guys to, to speak to Rick and get more of an insight from Next on, on how we're delivering that. Where that's then took us to, though, and, and, and more, you know, more relevant internally for Next is, is we're looking at the automation of the flu vac seen process so but it's, this again is all about lifting data shifting data inputting data but releasing capacity um, and, and this is taking data from gps of, of, of people who've had the flu vaccine and then inputting the data into the patient records whether that be an emis or system one there's a 
a, a big requirement on flu immunisation vaccines at the moment. So, you, you know, you can imagine that the increase in admin workers has, has followed that. So by us automating simple tasks within a wider process, we're, we're, we're enabling the staff to, to free up time. The one that Liz was going to talk about today, and unfortunately she, she's not with us, is is how flexible automation can be. And regardless of vendor, it, you know, it, it's where can we help? When when something happens, automation can step up and help. And I, and I think the, the pandemic, as we've all mentioned previously, has is, is highlighted this. So there is, uh, you know, struggles to, to get PPE. The, the, the re relation here from, from the North East is that the requests, though, the majority of them was coming from BSA into NHS England improvement. And... They were coming at four a minute, the backlog was stacking up, there was five people sat trying to trawl through these emails with attachments and forms on there. So within three to four days, we, we gave, uh, you know, we gave NHS England some software, we gave some resource and, and we managed to, to automate that whole process of receiving the email, getting the data out the email, putting it into service now and reduce that one exercise from sort of eight minutes to 15 seconds. This just re freed up five people to go and actually find the PPE equipment as opposed to just transacting emails coming in. Um, and again, that is now geared up to, I guess, effectively any other spike. We know we can scale up or down should we need to. What this has led to is, is a, a cloud environment in NHS England improvement. And, and I know they speak to the other vendors as well. But we've now got a, a, a you know an infrastructure in place in the cloud, in the NHS that is available to everybody. Um, so again, to, to the to the people in the northeast on this call, if you want to look at some pilots, you want to start to feel what does it look like, then there's an infrastructure there without you having to go to too much effort. And I think I mentioned before I lost you all that there's a connection with health and social care. And, and you know, I cover all public sector. Durham County Council is one of our biggest, longest standing customers. And, and whilst this particular case studies from, from Kingston in London, I think it highlights how we need to start thinking. You know, when we're having early stage discussions with Durham, how do we start to bring people together? This was a twos and fives of where, you know, this crossover between health and, and the councils and, and, and the whole patient experience of being discharged and, and what happens next. And, uh, you know, you, you can see the savings there. I think it was important for unblocking beds and speeding up the whole process. Again, you can speak to Kingston, you can speak to Durham. They're, they'll go into more detail of their particular journey so far, but they're not too dissimilar to what you've heard already. Something that I think we could bring to the Northeast, we have a vision, your iPath, and, and you know, we want to see a, a fully employed world where humans and machines work together. Um, and this is a global vision, but where we can bring it locally is, no matter what level, it could be, we've been running Academy Kids Live, it's about... I guess taking the digital environment, the digital world and bringing it to the whole region and people who may not always have access to this. So we've, we've run lots of Academy Kids live sessions, educating children on, on robotics. We then got our own academic alliance with universities globally, where again, we'll run courses for, for, for universities, we'll, we'll provide documentation, we'll, we'll make sure that we're educating people ready for the workplace. And then we have our UiPath Academy, similar to what you've seen with AA before, online training, fully certified. Um, you know, anybody can join the academy and take the courses. And I think I'm going to wrap up there because I think you've heard a lot of stories. I want you to take something away today. Apologies, I got caught off early, but I think, you know, take a robot today, try it for free, download the software from UiPath, have a go, um, you, you know, start to understand how this can help you in your own personal environment but also then you know as an organization um you wipe out the way to help as are everybody else who's on this call and i think it's clear that as a region you're going on a journey and, and maybe as a group we can all go on that together so i'll leave it there guys hopefully we've got some time back and appreciate you for, for, for letting me back on thank you matt that was great Okay, we're going to move on to our final speaker now, Jeremy Phillips from Cloud Trade. He's the Alliance Director, um, and he's going to be talking about um, his case study. If I can welcome you up, Jeremy. Thanks, Emma. Thank you, and uh, good morning, all. 
Um, so yeah, I'm going to be uh, talking a, a little bit today about um, a, another case study with Newcastle NHS. Actually, it seems it's the, the powerhouse of the northeast of automation. Um, but I'm very pleased to be joined by Stuart Smith today as well for two reasons. One, um, I think it's important for you to hear, you know, obviously from, from Stuart, you know, what the benefits have been for the projects and so on. Um, but secondly, for Stuart, for, for standing in, one of his colleagues who was going to be supporting the presentation has actually um, been off, but, but healthy and returning to work soon, but been off with a, a positive result of, of COVID. So I'm very pleased to welcome Stuart onto the call as well. And I think by, um, by way of introduction, uh, my name is Jeremy Phillips. I work for Cloud Trade. I'm the Alliance Director. I've been in a, uh, well, probably involved in the NHS projects for about 20 years now uh, of automation of back office functions. Um, but I, I think I would just like to hand over to Stuart. Um, Stuart, I'm not sure if there's anything that Neil missed on his uh, intro to, to the trust, but maybe if you could just introduce yourself and also a little bit more about the trust. Hi, um, I'm Stuart Smith. I'm one of the assistant finance directors for Newcastle Pontine Hospitals. Um, I think a lot of people probably know who Newcastle Hospitals are. Um, Neil picked and alluded to kind of a bit, a bit more around that earlier on. Um, I suppose just put, put, add a bit more meat to that kind of like, um, I suppose, scene setting. We're seeing over two and a half million patient contacts per annum organisation with the turnover and expenditure of about 1.2 billion, which continues to grow year on year. Um, we may be back office stack, um, back office function, but ultimately we're a key cog in kind of making sure the organisation continues to function on a day-to-day -day basis, making sure we keep suppliers happy, get the bills paid and make sure the suppliers continue to come in and get delivered to the front line to enable us to deliver the healthcare that's needed. Um, consequently, we pay over 220,000 invoices per annum to over 5,000 suppliers. Some of them are big national companies, particularly as well. There are a lot of them who are based locally in the Northeast. Um, obviously, another like big cap, big feather in Newcastle's uh, cap is that uh, we're the first organisation, um, NHS organisation in the country to be um, setting up an integrated COVID hub um, here in the Northeast, um, which will be delivering over 80,000 tests per day, um, hopefully by the end of this year into the early part of next year. So I'll hand back over to Jeremy just to take you through the, the, the first slides and I'll, I'll, I'll come back in later on just to give a bit of a summary around what benefits Newcastle received from the cloud trade solution. Brilliant. Thanks, Stuart. And yeah, I think just to, again by way of introduction, as the title says, you know what what we what we do within Cloud Trade is we automate the receipts and extraction of, of inbound documents. So in this case, we're talking about e-invoicing, um, but you know there's other use cases uh, for what we do, and the, the key focus is on delivering 100% accuracy on the extraction of data uh, and the application of a client's business rules around that data as well. So um, again, Stuart's going to come back and talk a little bit more about some of the benefits, and I think really importantly, actually, how that journey is continuing as well. You know, we always talk about uh, trying to get to a target operating model but I think you know what Stuart and the trust are doing is is that that's a, dynam a dynamic model you know they're always trying to sort of push forward uh, and keep going which I think is really important as well but just to talk a little bit about some of the drivers uh, that I think were influencing the the projects behind the scenes. Um, you're probably familiar with um, Scan for Safety, uh, the, those that are on the, um, the session this morning. One of the key pillars of that is something called PEPOL, and PEPOL is about enabling the supply chain to communicate digitally. It's about enabling um, a trust to be able to send out a purchase order to a supplier uh, in an agreed format, but without having to make changes themselves. Um, and then about the communication uh, transactions coming back through. So it'll be, uh, you know, starting to see things like um, invoices, in this case, coming back through from, from the supply chain. Um, for those that aren't familiar, Peppel and, well, particularly Scan for Safety, but Peppel has been around for a number of years. It's taken a little while to get some traction. I think it's fair to say uh, there's probably been some other distractions over the last six months or so. Uh, but, you know, I think, you know, m moving forward, there's going to be a, a big drive on Peppel as well. So for those that aren't familiar with it, I definitely encourage you to have a look at it. I think it's going to impact everybody uh, within the public sector and the, the supply chain over the coming months and years. 
But I think if you put aside the, um, I guess, the compliance side of the projects, the again, I mean, having been involved with the, the trust for a number of years, I think there were some strategic directions that the trust were trying to take as well. And that was supporting um, the local community. You know, it's enabling faster payments to uh, the local, maybe some of the smaller SMEs, uh, as well as being conscious of the, the government's BPPC uh, practice as well. So the uh, enabling faster payments, enabling the more accurate reporting of those payments as well. And it all came down to just basically ensuring the throughput of invoices was going through without um, any issues at all. Uh, a lot of the sessions, I think, are focused on, um, you know, not wanting to talk too much about the operational savings, and I think that's really valid. But I think we have to recognise as well the importance of freeing up staff time and actually the value add tasks that they, they go on to do. And Stuart and I have talked a little bit about this and that the savings that people um, are making in terms of man hours actually do go on and really contribute to some very successful projects as well. And you start to see knock on benefits that can't really be quantified uh, particularly easily for going back to one particular project. But if you look at the benefit as a, as a whole is definitely quite significant. Um, and the other side is, is about visibility, it's about controls and it's about accuracy of process as well. So you don't think of an e-invoice as, well, as an invoice or as, as an e-invoice as a, a particularly exciting project necessarily. Uh, I think within cloud, within cloud trade we're probably more enthusiastic about that topic than, than some others are. But I think you know ultimately what it's doing is, is it, it is driving the accuracy of data. If you get accurate data in at the start of a process, you know the knock-on of that is, is that um, the post receipt processing, the back office automation is more accurate. You've got more granularity of data available so you can start to do more improved reporting as well uh, down the line. So um, Stuart if there's anything I've missed please feel free to obviously touch on it at the end but I think just to talk a little bit about the before and after process. If you look at the, the, the finance function as you say uh, Stuart there's it's a huge volume of invoices that you process within the trust and historically some of those were coming through via EDI so these were touchless invoices in effect that were coming through um, communicated from a different system but all done electronically so there's very little touch point within the trust. The challenge was what to what to do with the the remaining documents the sort of the 85 percent plus of documents that were being sent in that um, up until the introduction of cloud trade were all being treated as either something that was handled via OCR or, or even manually entered onto the system and again simplified use case here but just to go through uh, the process that the before cloud trade process is the invoice would be received um, either ideally via um, an email but um, still coming in via paper in some cases so the invoices would be received they would be either opened or, or printed and manually registered into the finance system um, or using OCR again to go through and enter the details as, a, as an invoice registration. I think one of the bigger issues was the error correction is, is reasonably high when it comes to OCR and although OCR is good at, at automating to a point there are limitations to it and I think everybody can recognize that actually you still need to have the expertise of the AP team there to be able to to, to go back through the document and to say well that bit's wrong you know for this reason um, and to be able to add as I say a, quite a lot of experience into the document. Now that process there was taken anywhere from three to five days, you know, maybe occasionally a little bit longer, but again, it wasn't supporting the message of enabling faster payments. It wasn't enabling, you know, the automation. And there was a, I think there was a gap that was uh, identified there. For any purchase order based invoices, those would go through into a, a workflow based routine. So they'd be sent through for, for matching and then ultimately onto either payment to the supplier or into supplier query mode. For non-purchase order invoices, there is um, a process in place, or there was a process in place to assign an authorizer for that to then go through uh, via an email approval system, again, to be validated, coded, and ultimately sent on for approval. But again, the process there, if it was a purchase order based invoice, it could take a sort of a day or two. Um, but for some of these other challenging ones, uh, some of the challenging documents, it could take 30 plus days to actually get the payments made. So post introduction of cloud trade, there was a, if you like, an aspiration for all documents to be sent in digitally. And I think just going back to where Pepol and Scan for Safety comes from, this is all about enabling the supply chain communication. You know, Scan for Safety is a much bigger uh, program where, you know, it's all about uh, the patient journey. It's about understanding the supply chain, looking at the, um, the the materials that have been used during the patient's journey, you know, what's been assigned in, in procedures and so on. But from an invoicing perspective, it's about enabling the digital transaction. 
So enabling a supplier to send in a document, ideally to the trust without any intervention at all. Now, obviously the expertise within Stuart's team are such that um, actually there's quite a lot of process that they do. So the challenge for us um, is was basically to take the, the process there and to build in the expertise that the, the trust have um, and to go through this process. So what we do is we will take um, a, a document that's presented uh, as an invoice, you know, typically a PDF document that'd be emailed into the service. We would go through and extract that document in its entirety. So we're not just looking to pull out um, certain fields, you know, we extract every, every part of that document um, and then we can interpret it so we understand, you know, who it's from, who it's to, what type of document it is. So in this case, it's an invoice, it could be a credit note, it could be a statement, um, it could be, you know, purchase orders coming in, whatever the process needs, but in this case, it's an invoice. The validation stage is a key part as well. And again, if you get 100% accurate data, what that enables is us to apply business rules. So we can then go, go through and say, well, in the case of Newcastle or you know any of the other trusts that we process on, it might be that we say for certain supplies, they have to include certain data. So maybe a contract reference number, maybe um, a purchase order number. It might be that for timesheets um, from recruitment firms, they have to be, you know, there has to be a timesheet present as well. So we can do all the validation stage before potentially enriching the document as well. So enrichment could be you know, if there's a purchase order number quoted, for example, does that purchase order number exist against that um, supplier's ledger? And if so, you know, is it open balance, etc.? If not, should we reject it back or does it come through to, to the trust itself? And then the final stage really is about the, the export um, and producing the XML goes straight into the system. Uh, it's straight into the finance system and then it's available again for, for payment there. But the process that we've introduced um, replaces, if you like, the whole manual registration of documents. It's, it eliminates the need uh, for the sort of the three to five day elapsed time. And typically this process happens in under a few minutes. So again, from the point of the invoice being sent, it will be processed within normally sort of under five minutes, as I say, and available in the trust for, for payment or for further query. So that's, um, I guess, uh, an overview of the, the process. I'm very keen for you to hear from Stuart about the benefits um, and, as I say, the continued journey that they're on as well. So, uh, Stuart, if it's okay, I'll, I'll hand over to yourself now. Thank you, Jeremy. Um, so if we just move on to the, ne the next slide, Jeremy, that would be brilliant. Um, so I think, as Jeremy kind of alluded to earlier on, um, the initial process was taking three to five working days just to get an invoice into the system, never mind getting it <clears throat> verified or validated or authorised for payment, um, which can take some time. Um, consequently, this would potentially have a detrimental impact on our suppliers paying them later. Um, so we're keen to kind of get these invoices in from day one um, and ultimately get them pushed through the system as quickly as possible to ensure that we'll pay our suppliers timely and continue that good working relationship with them. These are some of the key, um, I suppose, benefits that came out of the um, the, 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 the program of works that, that we're still on with uh, Cloud Trade. So the graph on the left-hand side um, shows you the invoices process and ultimately kind of how quickly um, we scaled this process. Um, so. We, we do process, probably we're, we're processing about 220,000 invoices per annum. Um, I think by the end of the, well, the end of the project with, with Cloud Trade, we've got about 50% of those invoices being automa automated. We can see quite quickly, probably over about a three month period, um, we went from processing no invoices through this route to 7,000 invoices um, per, per calendar month. It did significantly reduce um, any, I suppose, I suppose any imp, imp, input time and um, manual kind of key, and we, we still held, had elements to do um, and to fo focus on that. But anything that was going through the cloud trade process was a hundred percent accurate. There was a few tweaks kind of at the start to make sure supplies supplies were set up. But once we were confident that those supplies were set up, those invoices didn't need to be reviewed um, by the counter payable team, and they could ultimately use that time to focus on more value adding exercises um, in terms of kind of resolving supplier queries, um, invoice queries. It did release um, a lot of staff time within the accounts payable department, um, albeit that we do process 220,000. It, it, it's a relatively small department and there's 15 staff in there. And um, we did manage to save um, in excess of two whole time equivalents staff time in there and we we'll released those savings and ultimately put those fed them back into the front line of the NHS to reinvest 
but not only did we save that that time and ultimately some cash releasing savings, there was some non cash release savings in that the accounts payable team um, were able to focus on other aspects of their job also. So we did re retain some of that efficiency in there and ultimately um, use that internally. Um, so it was a I say, I say that the degree of accuracy is is a hundred percent and something that that was a massive selling point. Um, far out outweighs the OCR um, element that we previously had prior to um, cloud trade, and that was there was always a need to go in and review those invoices. If we could just move on to the next slide, Jeremy. So I suppose let me just go on kind of um, through the trusts um, journey going forward. So we changed financial ledgers um, around March time this this calendar year um, and we moved to um, an Oracle Oracle Cloud solution provided through Northeast Patches, which is a consortium of NHS organisations hosted by Northumbria Healthcare. So there's about 40 NHS organisations who, who feed into that um, financial ledger um, solution there's a lot of um collaboration in there in terms of getting best practice out of all the systems we are continuing on by the the the, the, pe the pebble journey um as jeremy alluded to earlier on it it's still relatively early days but i think there's a lot of benefits um even over and above kind of the process that we that, that we were using through cloud trade albeit we, we we were going on that journey with cloud trade as well by introducing Pebble, we've also um, introduced end user requisition in receipting. So ultimately, um, the end users within the department can raise their requisitions, and um, those requisitions will electronically go out, out the door to the to the, the supplier. Suppliers supply the goods. Receipts will then be um, authorized electronically, and ultimately, um, that that, that receipt allows the invoice to be prepared more timely. What we're doing again is as an organisation to try and push the adoption um, of automating the invoice processes, rolling out a no purchase order, no, pay, no payment policy. Um, that's to, to assist with um, ultimately having a, having a purchase order and making sure our goods or services are received and in effect being able to kind of get that authorised, approved and paid um, more timely. I think one of the aspirational things around um, this whole process is that um, Pepple ultimately sends out an electronic um, order to another organization in a common language. Um, the, 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 there's um, talk around to be able to supply, being able to flip, flip that purchase order into a di directly into an invoice, therefore creating a kind of a 100% accurate invoice aligned to the purchase order, providing that those goods are then delivered in their entirety to the organization. That then allows the receipting to be more timely and ultimately once goods are received, the automated process would then allow the invoice to be paid to the supplier. And there's a, I think, I think um, we've, we've came a long way with cloud trade um, and vastly improved our accounts payable department. Um, and we are continuing on that journey as as technology has, has improved. Um, we're using the solutions that are out there and Pe Pebble is very much at the foref forefront of our thinking. So I think that's probably it from myself. If I'll just quickly hand back to Jeremy just to, to close the session. Yeah, thanks, Stuart. And um, I think the, the only thing, well, again, thank you again for your support on the call. Much appreciated. I, I think people probably hear from yourself rather than myself. But I think the the last thing to say from from us, you know, automation starts with 100% accuracy. And I, I think, you know, we've delivered, well, e-invoicing and, uh, and PEPOB based projects to about 60 NHS trusts now. And wherever we see that accurate data coming in, it is driving the change that we're looking for so it's not just about lowering the cost or improving the the point of receipt as i say it is very much about the back office efficiencies that we're after um, and and the downstream processing uh, the automation of those processes it, i think it, it often feeds into a bigger picture as well so if we look at scan for safety if we look at pepol and you think of the invoicing actually each of these small automation projects actually make a big difference when you scale them up into the bigger programs and you know some of the rpa projects some of the automation projects will be quite complex they'll be looking at loads of different data sources you know and it'll take a bit of involvement and i think um you know thanks to 
the trust like Newcastle, what we've been able to do is to deliver this kind of a project in weeks now. So although it took three months for the curve to build up from sort of zero, if you like, up to sort of near full to full target capacity, what we're actually seeing is trust coming on board, particularly um, with the likes of COVID uh, within sort of three or four weeks from zero to 100% of the documents coming through. So again, I think thanks to thanks to the trust for the support with that one. Um, and uh, Stuart, all the best to, with the ongoing journey as well. Emma, I'll, I'll hand back to you if I can. Thank you so much um, and thanks to all of our speakers um, for being so honest and sharing their, their use cases and examples and, and learnings on all of these. I'm going to ask all of the speakers um, to join me back on the stage now. Um, we're also going to be joined by Karen Gorman from Blue Prism as well. Um, and I've got some, some questions from the chat from, from the audience. So if you'd all like to come back on screen, that'd be fabulous. I'm going to kick off with um, a question that appeared in the chat earlier, which I think is really key, just thinking about um, the sensitive information that, that's being moved around in these automation systems, whether that's patient data, staff records, um, invoices, whatever that might, might be. How have you come, overcome um, some of those organizational barriers while staying safe with that data? My camera won't switch on, but I can, <laughs> I can answer that. Um, it's saying I'm blocked by, yeah, there we go. Um, so, so I think one of the key, the key things from it, I mean, obviously health data, which is where we all play is, is absolutely paramount and the security and safety of it is really, really key. And we wrestled with this early on, but I think the key thing to, to kind of understand that we, we did early on is that the data that we use around the automation systems never leaves the systems that it was intended for in the first place, that the automation platform is effectively like people. It, it, it doesn't take data out of say system one or ERS and put it into the platform. And, and, and then put it into somewhere else. It, it takes it like a human would and either copies it onto your own drives or secure shared areas or directly into the secure systems in the first place. So, so, it, so it, it's, it's effectively, it, it never actually goes into the platform. And, and I think whatever security you've got in place that in, in any of your systems that you wrap automation around still applies. You know that the, the robots still have, in our case, they have secure IDs, you know, NHS smart cards, albeit virtual, um, and and the data doesn't doesn't go into the platform. It just gets taken from A to B. Um, so so it's kind of it's quite well served in that respect. Um, and if you're not secure today with your people, then this won't be any different. But but it but it doesn't doesn't go in the platform. I guess is the headline. It's actually slightly more secure in the fact that it doesn't necessarily reflect it onto a screen. So quite often, well, the one that, that I spoke about, it's all happening behind the scenes. So the data's not rendered to the screen. Yeah. So it's yeah. sure. slightly more secure. Yeah. It doesn't get printed out by people either. Fantastic. Thank you. So I guess um, just talking more to, to NHS Connect Health, kind of those end users in, in, in this panel here. Um, you know, what were your biggest blockers to driving automation? Um, kind of how did you overcome them? And was there a piece of, piece of work that had to be undertaken in getting your exec team on board with what you were doing and, and how did you go about that? let someone else speak but I will if nobody will um I, I, I think there was two, a couple of things for us I think there's a bit around just just be really mindful of the human adoption element of it you know and, and I, I spoke before about you know be, just be really conscious of the this concept the concept of you know robots stealing my jobs and that sort of stuff it wasn't really a blocker but it was just something we really got a grip of early on and spent spent a lot of time just explaining what this was going to do and how it would help people um it still pops up occasionally but but as i say it's just it's about um just just getting everybody who's going to be involved involved and and you know from an exec point of view that wasn't really a challenge there was just more a question of making sure they supported it conceptually um financially it's just like any other business case you know just be really clear what you think your returns are going to be and uh you know and, and, and present it in whatever way so and i always i'm always really mindful of that you know, at any level, your audience has a particular lens. So, so when I'm talking to the CFO, I'm talking about the finance. 
when I'm talking to the CPO, I'm, I'm talking about the people, you know, and, and I think, you know, this is no different to anything else. It's just be, be clear of your audience and explain it to them in the language that they understand. Um, you know, but, but, you know, have a, have a viable business case, work it out. If it doesn't stack up, don't do it. Great, thank you. Um, I've had a question in about um, RPA use cases that span both health and social care. Does anybody have any good examples of those that they'd like to share? We're currently working with uh, one of the big local councils on uh, social work. Doesn't mm, not sure it completely spans what the the question is is after, but it's looking at emergency payments. So we're providing um, automation around about people who perhaps for one reason or another require an emergency payment from the council to make sure that perhaps their children are fed or they're clothed or something. Um, so it's discretionary payments, it's called, uh, and uh, the automation itself is a bit strange in that it has a break in the middle. So we, we process the information coming in and then at the, the point of actual payment, it stops and that's done manually uh, by the council, primarily because they have a, a hard token. Um, but then the automation resumes after the payment's made and does all the, the following up into ledgers and copying it through into the EDRMS system. So I think it's over health and social care. The other thing that I'd probably add to that, Emma, as well, I think, you know, we um, we see quite a lot of collaboration at the STP level as well between um, councils, NHS and, and social care. And I think a lot of them are, are looking at efficiencies that can be gained. So I think there is value in looking at the common goal between the, uh, as an, at an STP region. Uh, certainly when we've been approaching some projects to do with other, you know, PEPOL or um, ingesting orders and so on, that's been handled at an STP level rather than at an individual trust. And each, each trust and each council will be on a different back office system. System, you know they'll have different processes so everyone will have their own rules and their own take on things but there's a common supplier um, base in there uh, there's a you know a common supply chain uh, and overall there's a common set of re requirements to to lower the operating costs and to improve the accuracy and you know all the things that we've been talking about so I think uh, I'd certainly encourage the STP uh, engagement as well The patient discharge one that, that Matt mentioned is probably a really good crossover example um, because that's freeing up the beds in the hospitals, but it's actually liaising with social care. So that's probably the best example, that, well, certainly that I've been listening to today. Yeah, um, by all means, we can put you in touch or, or any of the, the, the group in touch with, with Kingston and, and how that integrates with each trust and the council. It's not my project, so I'm not being vague, but uh, yeah, my colleague down south delivered it. So um, happy to put you in touch with the right people. Great, thanks. We can share that afterwards. Um, I've also had a question on a, um, what's the panel's view on percentages across clinical versus admin when it comes to um, uh, automation and, and what are the risks of automating any of those clinical processes? Emma, hi, it's Patrick. Hello, Patrick. Hey, yeah. Um, if I'm honest, I think the um, I think certainly years ago when we when I started, I think um, certainly back office was was primed because actually from a risk perspective, it was probably deemed as relatively low risk. I'd say the last, I mean certainly the last ten business cases and now customers uh, are largely centered around outpatients um, processes. I think partially because that it's been de-risked by a number of trusts who are doing a number of automations, including you know look at what uh, what Graham's doing. But I, I would argue that these days. 80% of who we're talking to look at front office first and there's no reason why they can't then extend into back office but most of the business cases will have I would say anywhere between five and 30 processes anywhere between finance HR procurement outpatients booking teams etc but I think given COVID there's a huge focus at the moment on recovery and reset plans and a lot of those processes were just BAU processes before but they've just been accelerated so I would say nowadays certainly for us it's more akin to outpatient focused. Uh, and in terms of risk, I think absolutely, you know, you, when you're dealing with patient data when you're processing cancer referrals. That's why we go for an extended UAT process internally and then with the client, they literally click the button and it moves at a snail's pace to make sure they're happy. Uh, and nothing gets through without a 
fully fledged, you know, data privacy impact assessment that we have to complete for every client. Um, but yeah, I think I think these days certainly it's um, it's, it's it's seen as relatively low risk. Thanks, Patrick. Um, any advice for any businesses out there who are starting on their automation journey? How on earth do you select the right platform and, and knowing what it's going to do for you and is it going to address their needs? Um, I'm not sure who wants to take that. I mean, I can have a quick sort of go at it. I think that I think I think we'll talk about platform choice. I think the the factors. Are, I mean, being really fair, there's there's lots of different players in the room here. But from from an RPA and and a pure sort of robotic process automation point of view, I think arguably that there's there's a much of a muchness to a greater or lesser degree. Some some you know different UI path, blue prism automation anywhere they they will fulfil that need one way or another. <clears throat> and I'm sure each of them will have their own you know proof points that are different. Um, the, the things that you so so have a look at that and decide. I mean, you know, have a play with stuff. It would be would be worth doing where you can get uh, sort of free trials and things. Um, but I think look at it for me. We were looking at, looking at a bigger picture. You know, I, I didn't want to have to procure infrastructure. I didn't want to have to you know worry about my Azure hosting over here or Tin and uh, and all the rest of it. So so we kind of plumped for a slightly broader platform, which included all of that, and we subscribed to a platform as opposed to installing RPA. Um, you don't need to do that if you just want RPA and you've got a load of spare kit or, or you know an easy infrastructure you can deploy to, then then there's different ways of doing it. Um, so so I think you know that's that it's like you know like most product selection you know what what are your criteria? But I think in terms of pure RPA, you know it will boil down to probably which which one you feel you can maintain easier. Um, although we looked at a few and they, they were all much of a muchness to be really honest. Does that make sense? Any of our uh, providers want to jump in there with any words of wisdom? Hi Emma, um, it's Russell Automation Anyway here. I think uh, Graham did a good response actually. Um, it's it's very easy to get caught up on the technology, and you know I've, I have a lot of respect for what um, Matt and uh, and obviously Patrick are doing in in this space, right? And um, uh, I would I would say honestly have a look at what your requirements are. Try and dig down into what um, you want to do in the early days. Um, and and in my experience, this tends to come down to a couple of things. But what kind of um, access do you have to resource internally? Um, you know, are, are you going to try and run this entire program yourselves? Are you going to to look for partners to help you? All all of those things will come into play here. Um, and at the end of the day, I, I would say just run a competitive engagement, right? You don't, you don't have to run a big RFP, but have a look at the different platforms and see which one you like the most. And, and ultimately, it may come down to the, the one that you want to work with more than anything else. Great. Thank you, Russ. That was really helpful. Um, just finally, um, in the spirit of um, the health tech cluster that is just starting out, we're all about collaboration and innovation. How can we collaborate better across the region um, from all the different stakeholders kind of involved in this? Yeah, I can respond to that. Hi, Emma, it's Karen from Blue Prism. Um, I think the collaboration is absolutely key and it's something that we really promote with the digital exchange. I think with the extensive amount of NHS trusts that are building, constantly building automations now that can be shared free of charge. I think it's something that really is collaborating. And I think as well, looking at that whole ICS model that I think Jeremy mentioned earlier, looking at how you can collaborate and share a center of excellence for automation across an ICS, you know, using an automation platform. Again, it's something where you can drive acceleration, you know, really drive productivity, but get those automations live much quicker than if you're doing it all separately. And um, I think I think there's an environment that's being built here as well that you know does facilitate the sharing of that information as well. So hopefully you know as this as, as your journey grows um, and this gets bigger and bigger and bigger, I think there'll be an opportunity there for you know more projects to come to light. And I think hopefully that it'll be an active community. And you know certainly the projects that we get involved in, I'm sure everybody on this call does as well. If if a trust is talking to another trust who has similar systems, you know, has a similar set of requirements and so on, they're going to communicate with each other. They're going to talk about the good and the bad. Um, and I think this is a great environment to do that. So maybe, you know, if we can have a dedicated space where, you know, it encourages that communication about some of the projects that are ongoing, um, sort of on a real time basis, I think that could be quite useful as well. 
Yeah, definitely. And that's something that we really want to foster um, as part of this cluster, bringing in all those different partners and having having that space to, to collaborate and communicate. Um, we have three minutes left, so I think um, it's been a very busy morning. I'm going to just leave it there, I think. Any questions that we've got in the chat that we haven't managed to get round to yet, I'll circulate to the speakers and hopefully we'll get back to you on those. Anybody who wants to find out more about the Health Tech Cluster, then please get in touch with me following the event. Um, we'll be pushing out the um, recording and the slides, if that's okay with all of our speakers, because I think there's some fantastic content here for anyone who's just starting out on their automation journey um, to kind of help them on their way. So for me, thank you to all the speakers. Uh, thank you especially to CGI for supporting us on this event. And um, yeah, as I say, just Get in touch if you want to know more. And thank you so much for coming. Thanks, everybody. Thanks, everybody. Thanks. Pleasure Thanks. to see you. Cheers. Bye. Goodbye.